All right, my name's Katie Byrne. I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. And to my far right is Becky Witt, the board's attorney. Mr. French is right here. He is with planning. He offers recommendations to the board. As we go down on my left, we have Otis Freeman, board member, Leland Shelton, board member, James Fields, our chair, Bill Cunningham, board member, and Sabrina Turner, board member. Okay, so these are the people that will be before you here today. And um, just a reminder, masks are required in the room. I know it's super cold, but it's not as cold as it has been, <laughs> right? So that's, that's a positive, positive move in the right direction. So just a reminder, when you come up to speak, please, and I do it myself, please try to speak directly into the microphone because we are being recorded and Charm TV is um, also airing this. All right, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Fields. Okay, good afternoon, folks. Uh, <clears throat> we will uh, hear your arguments and endeavor to make a ruling uh, at the end of your matter, unless for some reason we need to defer deliberations on that matter, and we'll let you know uh, if we need to do that and why. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can feel free to you know be present for the deliberation. You can't you can hear it, but you can't participate in that. Uh, and otherwise, after that, uh, if you uh, can't stay or, or want to uh, get confirmation of the decision, contact the BMZA office at 410-396-4301. Again, 410-396-4301. Uh, but we ask that you not take any action in furtherance of your project uh, until you receive your decision and certainly don't uh, perform any work within Baltimore City before pulling the proper permits or without pulling the proper permits. Uh, on today's docket, uh, we generally break it up into two, a consent docket and then a contested docket or regular docket. Uh, so there are a couple of postponed matters and at least one withdrawn matter that we have to let you know about. Uh, and those matters will not be heard today. Uh, case number 2022-206, 3800 Hayward Avenue. Carlos Martinez is the appellant. That matter has been postponed. Again, 3800 Hayward Avenue. Um, a second matter, or actually the second matter that's being postponed is case number 2022-215, 6212 McLean Boulevard. James Gaines Jr. is the uh, appellant or the applicant. 6212 McLean Boulevard, it's been postponed. Case number 2022-220, 4600 York Road. Maurice Iguad. Uh, is the appellant there. Uh, that matter has been postponed in 4600 York Road. And we also have a matter that has been withdrawn. That's case number 2022-207, 312 South Broadway. Chanel Griffin uh, is the appellant there. 312 South Broadway will not be heard today. <clears throat> we also have uh, matters on the consent docket. Uh, so wait a minute, what are we doing? Are we doing the motion? We're gonna do the, mo oh, so if you guys noticed um, in the motion or the docket when you came in, there was a preliminary motion on the docket which will be heard first. Preliminary motion will take approximately um, 30 minutes. After that, the first three items on the docket will go and then after that we will go in the order of consent. So essentially, short answer is items are not gonna go in the order that they appear. Um, and so for those are, that are here for the motion, that will be the first thing that we handle first. So everybody, please sit tight. So Mr. Holzer um, and Ms., Mr. Engler, um, uh, just to remind everyone, Mr. Holzer, as the movement, first 12 minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and time you. So if I'll give you the two minute warning. And then Mr. Engler and Ms. Hecker, next 12 minutes, I'll also give you a two minute warning. And then it'll go back to Mr. Holzer as the movement for the last six minutes. So again, I'll, I'll try to give everybody two minute warnings. Um, so I'm going to get my, my clock going, and uh, you're up. Thank you. May it please the board, I represent the Cochrans in opposition to the applicant. I am assuming that the board has read our submittals on June 17th of 2022 and June the 30th of 2022. Sure. Mr. Holzer, Since. can I take one break for you to, for, so that our court Just reporter can get your need name? need to identify yourself with a record for me, please, oh. first and last name. John Carroll, C A R R O L L Holzer, H O L Z E R. Thank you. 
for your information. I've been practicing 60 years, in case you want to know. Thank you. All right. I'm assuming that the board has read our submittals since I am limited to 12 minutes. Uh, first, and I'm going to, uh, assuming that you've read them, I'm just going to hit the highlights here if, if at all possible. First, Roman numeral three, the Open Meetings Act should be complied with, respecting the closed minutes of May uh, 10th. That's all I'm going to say about it. Second. Uh, the circuit court judge in his decision stated that the previous board erred and in a number of ways which I want to make sure you understand. First, nothing the board did the first time was affirmed by the circuit court. Nothing. Secondly, there were deficiencies in the board's procedure noted by the judge, such as reconsideration, the board did not have jurisdiction to amend its decision. Application, no statement of justification was support with supporting evidence was presented. Expert, Mr. Barry, who I see here, uh, should not have served as both expert and advocate. Uh, six, communications. Agencies communicated with the application without notifying me, the opposition parapets on, in terms of the pre, previous uh, addition to the roof of the building. Parapets, no findings were made as to screening versus uh, decorative uh, parapets. There was testimony presented as to what they really are, and we've quoted them in our documents that were submitted <coughs> by the applicant's expert who admitted what they were. Uh, so you don't have to take my word, you simply take their word. Uh, deliberation, non non-existent, said the judge. Contents of resolution, not suitable for judicial review. Quote, absolute failure of the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals to comply with its rule to make specific statements slash findings of facts and conclusions of law. That's what happened the first go round. 10, approval of resolution. The board never voted on the contents. Finally, they, the judge said, the board did not apply the correct methodology for measuring height. Finally, he said, quote, this court has serious concerns about how the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals is conducting its procedures. Now, having said that, I would just simply move on to my response to the applicant's opposition to our preliminary motion. Number one, summary dismiss uh, denial of variance. There can be no variance for a residential care facility. Zoning code 14-334B2 requires it. The applicant improperly urges the board to ignore that established principle of statutory construction and treat it as mere surpluses. surpluses. That's wrong. Uh, City Council retains jurisdiction. This is the other motion, which was not addressed by the judge. Zoning Code 5-302C2 will um, readily um, uh, prevent this, this court or board from having jurisdiction over that issue. It could be simply avoided if the other side simply withdrew the PUD, which I've been saying for how long this case has been going on. C, 44-foot building with decorative parapets is not allowed by right. That's the issue about the parapets, the topography of the property. Incidentally, I assume you all understand that this project is not on flat land. It is on a very steep slope, 
very hilly property. Um, we raised the issue of miss, uh, missing site topography, but I must commend counsel, Mr. Engel, who's here today, came over and checked. He sent uh, the, the, the plan with the topography on it. That is not to say I agree with it, but that is to say he sent it and it has topography on it. Um, the um, height variance, again, is, um, is an issue uh, and uh, is, is relevant to this case. The missing site plan review is still missing. What was submitted was uh, 49 pages instead of multiple uh, documents, but basically they, in, they did not include forest and deliver, delineation, forest conservation, stormwater plan, landscape plan, all of which I think is somewhat relevant to a building and approval. Um, I think that there is no reason for me, that was in the response to the applicant's opposition. There's no reason for me to go to the preliminary motions on remand, which was much broader, had much more e uh, evidence and information in it. So having said that, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. May it please the board, Elliot Engel, on behalf of the applicant, CR Properties Development, LLC. We heard from opposing counsel many things that the judge did on the instructions for remand. What the judge did not do is accept many of the arguments we've heard for preliminary dismissal, which have already been argued previously to this board and all been rejected. The court did not accept these arguments. What the court did accept is rule Mr. The opposition, the Cochran's interpretation of uh, BMZA rule C2, where the court did not agree with this board's interpretation of that rule, that that rule is there for the board to understand uh, what is it that the applicant is seeking, and instead found that it's there for the public. And in connection with that, ordered a remand. The applicant accordingly submitted a seven page, single space statement of justification very detailed and backed up with exhibits, site plans, and all the relevant information. But what's important is, is that it's not a pre-hearing submission. It's to provide the board and the public sufficient information to know exactly what this hearing is going to be about. And respectfully, that has been satisfied uh, with the extensive submission of the statement of justification and the uh, exhibits that support that. I'd just like to address essentially two arguments that we heard that would arguably be a basis for a summary dismissal before we even have a hearing. One is the argument, again, that the circuit court did not accept, did not comment on, which is the argument we've heard uh, that residential care facilities are not eligible for a building height variance. Section 14-3 334B2 of the Zoning Code provides that a multifamily residential care facility must meet all general requirements, the bulk and yard regulations, and very importantly, and all other requirements of this code applicable to dwellings in the zoning district within which the facility is located. Of course, as we talk in our paper, a zoning variance is specifically provided for and addressed in the code. In addition, so it certainly complies with all requirements of the code. In addition, the stated purpose of Title V Subtitle III of the code is basically to provide relief from certain regulations of the zoning code when unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty exists. The position that the Cochrans are trying to advance before this board essentially would defeat the commonsensical purpose of the variance and having a conditional use uh, that wouldn't allow for a, um, for a variance. Of course, this board has always interpreted Section 14-334, 
to mean exactly what it says. The code provides for a variance. A variance is allowed for conditional use, um, which is the per what the code says and what the purpose of the zoning variances are. With respect to, we've heard again about a PUD, to be very clear, there is no PUD. The PUD has been vacated, has been vacated by the circuit court, has been affirmed by the Court of Special Appeals. A uh, writ of certiorari was filed with the Court of Appeals and has been rejected. There is no PUD. Section 5-302C2 of the Zoning Code provides that unless the legislation has been introduced to, to approve a variance by ordinance, then this board would be deprived of jurisdiction. There is no, there is no uh, legislation to approve any variance by ordinance. Accordingly, this board has full right to go ahead and allow the hearing to proceed. The other arguments we heard most respectfully have absolutely nothing to do with a preliminary basis for dismissal. I mean, we've heard about the parapets. It's our position that the parapets are there just to, uh, under section 15-301B5, it's there to screen mechanical equipment if there's any issue with that. Opposition can raise that at the hearing. That is not a basis for a dismissal prior to the hearing. Again, the submission has been lengthy. Our statement of justification provided all the information necessary for this board and the public to understand exactly what the hearing will be about. And then we've heard about failure of this board to comply with the Open Meetings Act. As we submitted in our paper, this board fully complied with the Open Meetings Act. It's specifically provided for in the statute. It's to shield the attorney-client privilege. The board fully complied with that, but even if there's any argument that it didn't, we fail to understand what's that got to do with the applicant. It provides absolutely no basis not to go forward with the hearing. Accordingly, respectfully, the arguments that have been raised have not been accepted by the circuit court, have all been rejected by this board, do not provide any basis not to go forward with the hearing. And therefore, we respectfully request that the hearing be scheduled as soon as possible so that this board can hear um, this application on the merits. And then the opposition will have the opportunity to raise any opposition it may have. If the board has no further questions, I will conclude my argument. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, the difference between argument and the difference between facts and the record. The court testimony in, tran in the transcript should be read by this board. What the judge actually said and did, you made a transcript, uh, a copy of the transcript. It's available to all of you. Sit down and read what the judge said about how this board failed to uh, uh, do its job the last time. And here you're back again. I know there's two new members to the board who may make a difference, I don't know. But this board needs to take what the judge said seriously. So read that. That's what I read. That's what I got my arguments from. And that's what I'll continue to tell it. Now, the court did not accept anything done by this board. They never affirmed anything, nothing, because there were so many errors, so much confusion, so much f facts that were not adhered to, and more specifically, the code, the city code. Okay? Now, I have a reply. I'm not going to go over all this stuff again. The facts and evidence is important, not arguments. You can argue interpretations of anything you want, but the facts and the record, the record in this case, under oath, supports our position. No matter what you do, no matter how you interpret it, it doesn't make any difference. His witnesses testified under oath to certain things. And that's all that counts. A 44-foot building, for instance. The parapet, for instance. They, they introduced it, not me. The circuit court will review 
who is correct in this argument as it did the last time when it remanded the case. I do not want to see this case get remanded again by your failures to comply with the law and do the things that you as sworn members of this board are supposed to do. And that is to inform yourself as to what you see, what you believe, and also to then apply it instead of just simply affirming or approving something by this board. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Procedurally, uh, with regard to a ruling on this motion, we are going to take that up at a separate time and not immediately right now. Um, we have, do we have a tentative date? Um, so what we had discussed in the general meeting was deliberating right now. Um, I think what some of the board members have shared is that they might not be ready to deliberate right at this very moment. Um, so they have, they've asked for additional time mm -hmm. to review documents. They call it time they want. Well, we, <laughs> um, problem is July 19th, we're gonna have two board members that are not gonna be present. Um, so the next opportunity for deliberations would be August 2nd. So August 2nd would be deliberations. And then, but what we're gonna do before everybody leaves is pick a date for a hearing on the motions because I don't wanna wait until on not on dang it on the merits <laughs> so we just had your motions argument if the board grants your motion then there is no date for the hearing on the merits if the board denies your motion then there will be a hearing on the merits so what we would like to do is what we had talked about before is hold a date in august or september for a hearing on the merits now the dates that i had presented to both sides previously we do not have a full board for those. So while everyone is here, we would like to get calendars out and establish the dates, okay? Yes, I cannot make the, the 2nd of August. I'm on storm. Right, no, understood, completely understood. You cannot make the 2nd of August. I think I had put the 10th and the 11th and the 24th and the 25th to the board. And I think, Mr. Holzer, those dates did not work for you. No, I'm, and, I'm sorry. Right, okay, wait, so let's do this. It's a do-over okay. right now, right? We're all starting fresh, and we need to figure out a special set date that works for both parties and all members of the board. So if everybody whips out their calendars real quick, let's take a look. Let's take a look at August. All right, so if the board deliberates August 2nd, right, we need to essentially write a resolution. Becky, where are you? Okay, all right. Um, so now we're looking at, it would be Wednesday, really Wednesdays and Thursdays in August would probably be the best as far as room availability. Or we could do a Tuesday that's not a hearing. Um, so we have hearings on the 2nd, the 16th, and the 30th. So I think the we could do the 23rd, 24th, 25th. 23rd, 24th, 25th. Nope, none, none of those are good for you, Sabrina? No, just the 23rd. Just no on the, I got a no on the 23rd. Anybody on the 24th? I sound like an auctioneer. <laughs> I'm okay on the 24th and 25th. 24th and 25th, you're okay, Mr. Holzer? 24th, 25th, Mr. Engel, Ms. Hecker? Yes. Okay, how about, how about this group over here? How about you five? 24th and the 25th? Good. The 25th has to be an afternoon, but the all day 24 and the second half of 25 are fine. 24 is good for me. I might have to take a a brief recess between 12 and 12 15 settlement or uh, the postponement court <laughs> yeah but yeah a birthday yeah. but then i can come back okay um, yeah that should work so it sounds like the 24th might work for everyone yeah. does the 24th work for everyone yeah yep. all right so let's say 24th can we can we shoot for um 9 a.m 
10 a.m. 10 a.m. probably better for us anyway to get the room set up and make sure everything is, make sure Charm TV is all right. So 10 a.m. August 24th for, now I will let you all know whether it's here or planning commission, okay? I, I would like it to be in the planning commission room. I think we would all like it to be in the planning commission room, right? Will the, uh, yes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, will the, um, if we have witnesses or someone, would they be online? Could, or no, could has to be in person. Everything has to be in person, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all in person. All right, so that's it for our preliminary motion then. So everybody's got their calendars blocked, 10 a.m., August 24th, and we will let you know location. All right. Okay, all right, thank you, everyone. So it's still, so what we can. I'll tell them that. Okay. okay. All right, so thanks everyone. We, um, we're getting ready to move on our docket and we have the first three on our docket, which are um, 2022, 188, 2022, 189, 2022, 190. This is uh, where we picked up from the last time. Um, so what we would like to do, I understand there's, there's not an agreement between the parties. So what the board would like to do is we heard, I guess, the preliminary argument, we heard the applicant make their testimony on 2022-188, the last time we were here. But if we could just, if you could talk about each one then, and then the opposition can come up and talk about each one, rather than what we were doing last time was hearing one, applicant, opposition. Hearing two, applicant, opposition. Let's go through all three and then from the applicant side and then all three from the opposition side um and so i think that might be easier or smoother and we can go forward from there okay everybody has to get sworn in again um no, but sure. let's see so anyone who's going to testify for all three of them should stand up and get stand sworn up and yep. be sworn yep so everybody, anybody that's here for these first three hearings on the docket if you're going to be testifying please stand up raise your hand and be sworn I'm going to swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right? Yep. And again, for the record, we're calling cases 2022 188, which is 1415 through 1417 Edding Street. Case number 2022 189, 1426 Drood Hill Avenue. And case number 2022 190, 1434 McCullough Street. And the appellant for each is Black Women Build, LLC. And all said. And, and just to confirm, so did you do you feel you were completed your applicant testimony on the first one? That was the um, yeah. food hall. Okay. Yeah. So so if you could move on to um, your next two then. Okay. Before she gets started, could she uh, introduce herself and spell her <laughs> name into the record for me, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is Shelley Halstead. Shelley S H E L L E Y, and Halstead is H A L S T E A D. 
like in yep and Becky just reminded me that we have to make sure we have all staff and planning reports in I think we did staff and planning on the first one but yeah. we did not do staff and planning on the other two so we'll do staff and planning for the next okay. two now oh yeah so mr. French do you want to oh. mr. Fr did mr. French didn't get sworn okay. <laughs> I was like no you don't need to get sworn <laughs> Do you tell me swear they tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. So for hold on, hold on one second. So for um, we went through Edding Street the last time. So staff report for 2022 189 1426 Druid Hill Avenue project to use a portion of the first floor as an art gallery neighborhood commercial. It's a conditional use. Um, Twelve in. 2017, 1426 Druid Hill Avenue was consolidated with 1428, 1430, and 1432 Druid Hill. Pre-consolidation, the property had been used as a beauty shop. Appellant proposes to use only the section um, that is 1428 Druid Hill Avenue for neighborhood commercial. And then for 2022 190, 1414 McCullough Street, the project is to use the premises as a retail goods establishment, no alcoholic beverages, restaurant, and multifamily dwelling consisting of three dwelling units. Conditional use is requested, neighborhood commercial retail. Second one is neighborhood commercial restaurant. Off-street parking spaces, three are required, two are proposed, so it's a one-space parking variance. Last authorized use was as a place of worship and educational facility associated with the place of worship, which was permitted in an R8. Property was originally constructed as a single family dwelling, but used as a multifamily dwelling with three dwelling units in the past. No. No, sir. No, 1434, I apologize. Okay. Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department has reviewed this application for 1426 Druid Hill Avenue. As mentioned by the BMZA staff report, this property is actually an assemblage of four original separate properties, 26, 28, 30, and 32. The department noted that the building as consolidated is qualified for neighborhood commercial establishment uses, such as the proposed use, which is an art gallery, which is a type of neighborhood commercial establishment included in the zoning code. The property known as 1428 formerly had a beauty salon, which is a type of personal services establishment, also a neighborhood commercial establishment type. And 1432 was a residential mixed use building that included a restaurant, again, establishing that the property is qualified as neighborhood commercial establishment use. The department also notes that these, these uh, properties as consolidated are in the Upton's Marble Hill Historic District, and therefore, in recommending approval of this application, the department requests that the board make the approval conditional on having all exterior changes, including additions, demolitions, alterations, and signage completed or installed in accordance with an authorization to proceed, which would be issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, Ms. Halstead, before you begin, uh, should the board uh, be inclined to grant your petitions uh, are those conditions acceptable that comply with CHAP? Oh, I've already been uh, authorized to proceed. Yes. Very well. So yes. All right. We doing it. You may proceed, ma'am. Um, okay, so uh, this is now consolidated into 1426 Druid Hill Avenue. Um, the building has been in complete disrepair and has further deteriorated over the years. And so um, part of the rehabilitation is to turn these into um, 10 artists live workspace, artist lofts, basically. Um, if they work in them, it's up to them, but it's, that's what it, it is intended for um, folks to live there. And um, 1428 would be a full floor gallery. Um, and that's to show, well, show their art. Also, um, hopefully get some other artists in there uh, in Baltimore and throughout the region. Um, the conditional use, um, it's, I mean, it's the, let's see, neighborhood commercial establishment um, is defined as non-residential use that is within a residential or 
office residential zoning district, but in a structure that is non-residential in its construction and original use or has received prior zoning approval for non-residential use as evidenced by permits construction or historical evidence of lawful non-residential use. And so it has been. So it's already um, had that approval. And the non-residential use is allowed. Um, it's art studios or art gallery. Um, so that's in the conditional use, and that's under 2.2. .2. So um, that should be fine. I think all the, basically, um, I went through and through the conditional uses and um, spoke to each one. I think that's in your packet um, to show that this is something that can be, that can be done. Um, really hoping to, I don't, I don't even know what else to say. I mean, it's just like, it's the conditional use and that's, that's what it is. It's the whole block, right? All four houses together? It's not, uh, yeah, it's not the whole block, no. but it's, yes, the it's on the corner. Yeah, oh, sorry, yes, it's the whole block of houses. Yeah. Um, this is what this will look like when it's done. I think, I don't know if I sent you pictures of what it looks like, what it looked like, but um, that, you know, the roofs had failed, there'd been a fire. Um, it's just in complete disrepair. So at this point, uh, one of the first buildings is stabilized. 1430 has been stabilized and the roof is on it. They've started stabilization of 1428, which will be the, um, will be the gallery. And we're just moving forward. Um, again, I have CHAP pre-approval for that building and Again, I do chat with every, you know, my other hat is the executive director of Black Women Bill Baltimore, and we do chat with, with everything that we do. So we're well versed in um, how to meet those requirements and actually exceed them. Okay. Um, I did present on June 27th after this meeting, uh, two weeks ago, I was asked to present again to the community, so went and did that and uh, the questions left were revolved around again garbage and parking um, and I tr tried to assuage any any concerns um, around those things um, and so I think there were maybe maybe two people that weren't already at this hearing that had showed up to then and then of course there were people that were in support as well um, that showed up to that that meeting and I was presented about a half an hour ago with this document um, which which during the meeting they asked if I'd be interested in an MOU or a CBA and I asked for a um, I asked for an example from someone else and I did not receive an example but I, I received this about half an hour ago so um, I don't know if that's procedure uh, to to have a CBA or to just receive one before the hearing but um, I haven't seen any examples of any others so I'm not quite sure um, what what the what the um, historic Marble Hill Community Association um, what other types of CBAs or MOUs they have uh, so you say so, the Community Association gave you that half hour before the meeting yeah yep so I haven't, I'm, you know. I have a question, just a mm -hmm. small question. Is it a community benefits agreement or is it an MOU? Is, is, is this, is a, uh, this is called a community, I think this is a community benefits okay. agreement. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think the the question, we received a question from the board which I'll go ahead and, and, and they said, did we get a copy? And so we got an email this morning uh, around 9 a.m. from Marble Hill with a copy of the document that um, she has in front of her right now. Um, but we didn't know the status of any conversations. So right before we came out, had a conversation with them in the hall, and this is the first time that, that, that um, the applicant is seeing the document that was emailed to us this yeah. morning. And I would just say that where it says Ms. Halstead indicated her willingness to receive the document, I, I indicated my willingness to receive a document 
not, not this document, but a document as an example. Um, so you, if you only got this 30 minutes ago, you haven't even had a chance to negotiate oh no, I, any of the thing in it. Yeah, but I, I again. Yeah, you know, I understand. Oh, like unilateral. Yeah, it, no, it, that's, no, there's, there's enough community members that we, that I speak with, um, and another association that has, that I have full support from, and I'm happy to continue conversations, but there's been no, there has been no, um, examples of CBAs with any other developers, even with one of the developers, uh, Bethel Empowerment and Wellness Center, they, I don't think they've signed one. I could be wrong. But, um, and that's right across the street from um, one of these projects. So I don't really see, I feel like there's a little uh, disparate treatment happening. But um, so I will, I will look at this again, and, um, but I, I, I I'm not gonna sign that. Um, so I think that's it for 1426. Okay. Um, it's gonna be beautiful. I don't know. That's editorializing but it's going to be okay oh one quick question i, I think you're going to get to this probably once you finish the 1434 I, I said one quick question i think you'll probably get to this once you get to 1434 mm -hmm. i'm just trying to see um as you know one of the um requirements is that is there that the establishment be pedestrian oriented so how how far apart are these three facilities look like they're like almost in the same yeah, okay. I think that I thought I put a map in there, but it's um, one. It's a block away, and then the other one abuts the other one. So this is, I mean, these are one minute block, um, one minute walk down the block to go to. <coughs> Got it. Any of these. Mm hmm Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, happy to hear you on fourteen thirty four. Okay, so 1434 McCullough. Um, Mr. French, had you given your oh, reports sorry. on both? He's got the thing gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to hear reports on 1434. Uh, Planning Department also reviewed 1434 McCullough Street application. Um, Note that, as with the previous property, this property is also in the Uplands Marble Hill Historic District. And therefore, any work that is approved by the board would be subject to an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. The department noted that the building does have a record of use, which would make it eligible for consideration for neighborhood commercial establishment use. Um, and specifically, the proposed use is for a retail goods establishment with no alcohol sales and a restaurant, uh, plus three dwelling units. The property had been used as a place of worship and an educational facility associated with that place of worship, which made the building eligible for consideration of non-residential uses such as what is proposed. The department is recommending approval subject to the condition that all exterior changes, including additions, demolitions, alterations, and signage are completed or installed in accordance with the authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Yeah, so 1434, um, Again, you have what I sent in, but um, basically there's not a lot of food in the area. Um, I'm working on my house and I was hungry and there was nowhere to get anything. And that was super frustrating because I get um, emotional when I'm hungry. <laughs> so, so I, this is something we've talked about and I would say folks in the community, um, and the suggestion to have uh, apartments upstairs in order to subsidize um, the, the cafe slash grocery, right? So that um, ideally someone can start their business, right? And not have to worry about paying rent, right? That's the goal, right? For the first year so that they really, so it really takes hold because paying rent uh, as a new, entrepreneur is very difficult. Cafes don't make a ton of money. So ideally the rent offsets that. Um, and then my goal is to, you know, once people start making money that then you could start chipping in, right? Um, so it's basically a food desert. I think there's a, there's some other term that's being used now, but um, I can't remember it right now, but it's a food desert. 
and trying to change that. So trying to create jobs, community space, and food, right? And um, I live on the block. I live right in the middle of 1434 McCullough and 1426 Druid Hill Avenue. I mean, like right smack dab in the middle, Tribe Called Quest. So, um, so that's about it. There were some suggestions um, about um, you know, about safety or concerns about that? Would it be, um, and would there be like a security guard or something? And that's something um, that definitely want to think about that. Um, but again, I, I really feel that the more we have people out and about, um, the more eyes on the street, the more bodies on the street and people coming and going and and then maybe honestly like you know um the police will care a little bit more if there's more people on the street and more people out and there's businesses being affected i don't know um, but that is the hope um i i looked when i was looking for looking up some of the stuff i found the 2005 um Up, upton master plan and in that it talked about what they envisioned for for the area and i emailed that earlier but it's like recommendations for this area are intended to build upon existing strengths and take advantage of developments in adjacent neighborhoods the focus here should be on preserving and redeveloping existing structures that's what i'm doing um, in order to increase housing values that's what we would hope Corner stores should be restored as commercial or office space with apartments on the upper stories. New infill housing should be built on vacant lots in order to restore the original development pattern whoops, of the area. Mixed use development should be encouraged along the edges in order to create a more seamless integration between communities. That is what I'm doing. I think that um, this was from 2005 and it may not have been realized yet. Right. I think it's been difficult to get there. And so looking at the new master plan, it's very, um, it is residential heavy, right? We, and, and home ownership, right? Because that's what we do want. We want a lot of home ownership. Um, and, but we're missing the component for what are those people to do? What am I to do when I'm hungry or when I want to go somewhere? I have to get in my car and drive. Usually I drive to, say, Remington right or you know when i wasn't so busy i'd walk down to mount vernon marketplace instead of drive but i think this is i don't know i think this is a great use of the space it's a beautiful beautiful space i have this anyway i don't know it matters but this plaster anyway and redoing this it's like 13 14 foot ceilings plaster it's going to be beautiful so i hope you guys come but that's that's about it. Um, and Ms. Hall said, is there anyone you know who wants to testify in on behalf of any of the second two properties that yes. we didn't hear from last time that's going to say something different? Oh, okay. If you were done. I'm I'm done. I mean I'm you know, I have well, again, you'll have the you'll I have was gonna final. say I have mm -hmm. I have She's yeah. the rebuttal. Yeah. But we just want to be sure we cover all the testimony to have a full hearing. So, yeah. so, so again, if you're here to testify in support, um, and if you didn't testify the last time and you have something new to say, if you could please come up here and line up at the podium. For any of the three. For any of the three. I think it's, I think it's a go. Okay. <laughs> State your name, ma'am. So, Kathleen Mitchell. I live in the 1800 block of Division Street, and I'm a registered voter, homeowner, and supporter of all three projects. Just to recap, last two weeks ago, I supported the uh, warehouses be, being converted to a food hall. Since that time, I had mentioned, mentioned that there was a rumor that Clarence Mitchell Jr. actually boxed at that location, and he did. So it's a very important part of our history for the community. So I wanna talk about 1426 Druid Hill Avenue. As you know, artists are the gatekeepers of truth. We have very accomplished artists in West Baltimore. 
Joyce J. Scott, a MacArthur Fellow, whose work is in the Smithsonian, Devin Allen, whose photo of the Freddie Gray riot was featured on the cover of Time magazine. When I think about this project, I think about a friend's nephew who went to Jubilee Arts. Now he works at Lowe's. This would be a perfect project for him to live in. I know, I think uh, Shelly's looking at 30% of the AMI. He could work at Lowe's, do his artistry, and showcase it in the art gallery. We must be mindful of the history of artistry on Druid Hill Avenue. 1216 Druid Hill Avenue, Lily Mae Carol Jackson lived there, encouraged her daughter Virginia Kaya to paint. When Aunt Virginia could not get into mica because of her skin color, she sent her to Philadelphia College of Arts. Today, my Aunt Virginia's work hangs in the Savannah College of Art and Design, but nowhere in Upton. 1230 Druid Hill Avenue, another place for artistry. My father, Dr. Kiefer Mitchell, showcased his artwork on the second floor of the building. Art was his escape from the trauma of integrating Gwens Falls Middle School and being mobbed. It was also an escape from seeing the daily medical effects of a blighted neighborhood. Finally, Romare Bearden lived in, I believe it was the 15 or 1600 block of Druid Hill, not too far from this project, while he was a cartoonist for the Afro-American newspaper. Shelley, <laughs> as you know, I work on her, I'm part of her board for the nonprofit. She has a partnership with the Baltimore Museum of Art, and I'm sure she would use her connections with the BMA to help these artists in the lofts. And I think we've also talked about probably trying to get Reginald Lewis Museum involved, but we need a place for artists, and we need them to have an affordable live-work sp live space. Finally, as far as 1434 Druid Hill Avenue. I did, before I start on that, board members, I did send it, sit in the meeting, was it last Monday? And Shelley did not agree to a CBA. She asked for a copy of one as an example. So we even asked for, I remember Shelley asking during the board meeting, with Marble Hill if she could have a recordation of the meeting, and that was denied. So she didn't get a copy of an example of a CBA, nor did she get the recordation of the meeting. So despite all this back and forth, I just want to remind everyone that despite the tensions with these projects, we should be celebrating. When we started these hearings last month, it was 112 years to the very month, just four blocks north, that William Ashby moved into 1834 McCullough Street, sparking the desegregation of housing. And here we are today supporting a black woman developer for three multi-million dollar projects. Another reason to celebrate, I helped look over these contracts for Shelley. My great-grandmother, Lily Mae Carol Jackson, couldn't even buy properties in the city in the early 1900s. And here we are today. I helped look at contracts, and we're, bef we're before this diverse board asking for these revolutionary projects. As far as a pro concern about trash, as a board member of Black Women Build, we are personally <laughs> using our funds that we get to maintain lots around the community. The city has, is short-staffed, and we are the ones who spend our own money to <laughs> maintain all these lots. This is on Shelly, you know, and we have organized two community trash cleanings within the last year. Anecdotally, two summers ago, we, the board members, were meeting on Edding Street to discuss our projects with the housing director of the state. While we were going over the meeting's agenda, Shelly noticed one of the workers toss her styrofoam cup in the gutter. Shelly stopped the meeting that we were prepping for with the state, mind you, with significant funds, 
and she approached the worker in a firm but considerate tone, said, you can't throw trash in the streets. That's not our agenda. <laughs> My concern, you know, is we have all this um, concern about trash in the neighborhood. My neighbors and I don't even go through many, too many establishments in Upton. Pennsylvania Avenue is strewn with trash. There's killings, or actually shootings, within the last year. And a lot of that is attributed to trash. But Shelly has a track record to eliminate trash. Also, she's an invested community member. I have a corner store 500 feet from a house in Division Street. I've lived there five years. I've never been in that store. I would not support it. The owners allow people to defecate in front of the store and throw their trash. I actually pick up the trash around the corner store that I never frequent. This would not happen with Shelley's developments. I fully support these projects. Shelley has led Black Women Build the Nonprofit to win global awards. She just returned from Austria to accept an award for innovation. The whole world's watching her. These projects will be a success and a benefit to the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. If there is uh, no one else in support, then we will uh, hear the opposition. Well, we didn't really give them yeah, we're going to, of course, this is for new information that you're presenting uh, that hasn't been presented previously, and uh, any new information, of course, with the second two projects. Mm -hmm. State your name, and uh, is this something new you'd like to submit for the record? I'll let you tell me what it is when you start. Uh, this is from the... Well, you're, you're not on the record. I want you to go on the record. State your name. State your name and spell it for me, please. Okay, my name is Atiba Nkrumah. I am the president of the A-T-I-B-A N-K-R-U-M-A-H. Thank you. I'm the president of the Historic Marble Hill Community Association, uh, an organization that I have belonged to as uh, in leadership and on the board uh, since 1973. Um, and what I provide here is Okay. Uh, Excuse there, me, what community association are you affiliated? The Historic Marble Hill Community Association, Upton's Historic Marble Hill Community Association. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have provided uh, Ms. Byrne uh, a letter uh, from myself uh, and also this document here uh, that we had sent her this morning along with the uh, community benefits agreement that we wanted uh, to present to Ms. Halstead. Okay, so this document that you just handed to me this has been presented for the record to Ms. Byrne? Yes. Well? No. no. Okay. Um, let me see. No. Okay. Um, this came from our meeting, all right, with Ms. Halstead uh, last Monday uh, that we wanted to make sure that... Uh, what is this? What is it? This is a questionnaire. There were uh, 15 people who attended the meeting, and we wanted to get those 15 people's input, all right, uh, uh, regarding the issues that we were discussing and it breaks down that based on that the input from all 15 people uh, it is objective it is what the 15 people had had to say uh, and uh, the record speaks for itself okay so what i am handing out to the board is what we received this morning which was the letter and the agreement so i printed that out thank you this I just felt a need to, to bring this uh, because I realized that uh, Ms. Halstead had asked for a, a recording of the meeting. Uh, and we usually do not give recordings of the meeting out um, to, you know, just generally. Uh, and so it was a, an, a request that uh, at the time, uh, because we had not been asked that request before, we were unable to or unwilling to do that at the time. All right. Uh, it would have to be a complete board decision. The board has not met all right, in order for us to authorize anything like that. The committee is not at uh, privilege uh, to do that itself, and neither am I as the, off as the uh, chief officer or at privilege to do that myself. It would have to be a board decision. Well, let me ask you before you begin, sir. Mm -hmm. Were you 
Were you the individual that provided this document? Um, let's see. Am I missing something here? It's two pages. Oh. Two pages. Three pages. Right. It's a letter and then okay. a two-page agreement. One was stuck to the other. This uh, community benefits agreement between Historic Marble Hill Community Association and Black Women Build. Did you provide that to Ms. Uh, Halstead today? Uh, we did. Okay. Why did it? Did she not get it until? Well, you said to do we provide it today? Yes. We, we did not provide it previously, all right, uh, because we had not had it completed at that time. Uh, I was working on that with uh, our secretary, all right. Uh, uh, both of us were under the gun to do some things. Uh, I am a, a caregiver to my wife who was disabled. All right, I was unable to get this done as she was unable to get it done until the last minute. Okay. Has this been approved by your board? Uh, no, it has not been approved totally by the board, all right, and therefore, you know, it's something that we were simply doing with Ms. Halstead before we went then to the board to say that, you know, we could work this out. So there's no formal opposition from the, your board? No formal opposition at this, at this point, right. all right, at this point there's no formal opposition. There are folks who, a couple of board members who took difference. Right. All right, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, you may okay. proceed. So, uh, um, first of all, just some, some opening remarks about uh, historic Marble Hill. Well, we've heard a lot about Marble Hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. We've heard a lot about Marble Hill. Yeah, a absolutely. So we don't need those remarks. Either. Well, I, I, I want to put it in context, in the context from my perspective. Well, we've heard that as well, sir. Um, we're on the, anything you didn't say with regard to the first project and anything new or that you'd like to add with regard to the other two, and but not necessarily the history, because we've gotten the history from a lot of folks about Marble Hill. We're very clear about In general, a summary of why you are in opposition to what she's requesting before us today. Okay, yeah, then I can speak to that. Okay. Um, our first thing is capacity. Does Ms. Halstead have the capacity to do these major projects? All right. Uh, there are three projects, and I looked in the Baltimore Journal recently, and there was an estimate of $6 million all right, to do these. Ms. Halstead in the past has done uh, small houses, and she's done an excellent job. You know, I've had an opportunity to you know, go through her project and see a couple of the houses, which I was very impressed with. But that is a very small development. As also a, as a, 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 a contractor previously, I know that what it takes to do something like that. Uh, I also know that the immense difference between doing these major projects and one home, okay? And so I am, first of all, concerned about her capacity. Uh, I realize that even in that capacity, all right, as she acquired these properties, uh, she also uh, did not really take into account that she needed to secure the properties. She ended up with a fire in the properties which also was an unfortunate situation for our community. Uh, it also was more costly for her, or maybe less costly for her, because, you know, it was a burnout and uh, did not have, require as much demolition, costly demolition. And so... Uh, you attribute uh, that to lack of capacity? Yes, lack of capacity. I'm, I'm saying because, you know, whatever it was that, you know, when she purchased these properties, she didn't do anything to secure the properties. She did little to secure the properties. And so therefore, it opened the properties up to folks just coming by and ended up, either it was a squatter or someone who deliberately set the fire. Which one of the properties caught fire? 1426, all right, 1426 McCullough Street. Jewel Hill. Hill, I'm sorry, Jewel Hill. 1426 Jewel Hill. Uh, so um, in terms of her capacity, therefore, in terms of the finance, which we are interested in, in terms of the timeline, how long is it going to take to do these properties? You know, we heard her say in the previous one, two to three years in one case, and you know, a little bit longer in the other case. All right, uh, we're concerned about that. What's your concern? That she may not be able to do that, given capacity. That so she, if she does nothing, what happens to the property? If she does nothing, um, don't the property sit? She said she said that she would pe uh, prevail, she would move the properties on. She would pass the properties on if she does nothing. But she doesn't have to. You understand that, right? Pardon? You understand that she doesn't have to, yes. to do that. Yes. Yes. So what happens if she does nothing? If she does nothing, again, we're back at square one. All right, we're back at square one. 
and we've been at square one for some time in those properties. Right, we, so you'd like to move past square one, right? We would like to, we'd like to, and yes, we want to move past square one, but we want to be sure that we have a developer of capacity, all right, who is capable of moving that within the timeline, she says, and given all the parameters that she has to, you know, do. So what kind of proof are you asking Ms. Halstead for to satisfy you? Um, I would like to know a little bit about finance, all right, that she has the kind of financial backing, all right, that is going to give her, because she's, going to, she's not going to be able to do this herself as a contractor. She's going to have to hire others, which she has done before, of subs other, and whatnot. Of other developers coming into your community? Hmm? Have you requested financial information of other developers coming into yes. your community? Yes. Are they willingly given that information? Uh, yes. In what, in what form? Um, uh, and I'll have, have to ask uh, my secretary to address that, because we did have other forms in terms of uh, one developer uh, um, who just recently, you know, all came to us who was developing a property 1406, 1406 to 1406 Hill, all right, and did provide us with the kind of financing that he had to do the property, plus his, his history of doing other properties said he had the capacity. That he, Mr. you said Chair. that he, that he had? Hmm? That you said that he, he, he provided this? Yes. Okay. He provided. Mr. Chairman. Pardon? I'm going to ask the chair. Okay. Um, I just want to note that I go through the criteria for approval or denying of a conditional use. I don't see a single word that speaks to the capacity or the financial capacity of the developer to, you know, finish a project in a certain number of years. So that's not before us then. Mm -hmm. huh? So that issue is not before us. It's not, it's not before me. And, and, it, and it's helpful that I understand what the basis of your opposition is. So, okay. tell me what else besides capacity is a, is, a, is your basis. Okay. Well, capacity I've already I've recovered the capacity. Uh, the other thing is, you know, my understanding of the variance that is before this body right here, uh, which was I thought concerning 1434, all right, McCullough Street, and the variance was a parking variance, all right. Uh, which we are saying that, you know, uh, there are two parking spaces that she has. Uh, because of the density in the neighborhood, uh, there is a empowerment and wellness center across the street. There is a church that holds regular meetings during the week, Bible study and other meetings during the week. Uh, there is a church on the opposite corner on Druid Hill all right, that also, uh, although the church is not functioning right now, there is a proposal for a new congregation to come into that church. And we realize that there is a population density right there. We are concerned, therefore, about parking, all right? Uh, we have multifamily dwellings, the 14 and 1500 block of uh, George Hill, there are more multifamily dwellings on our block than there are in most blocks in this area. And so we realize that that is going to be a problem. We're talking about a walkable community. I walk to Bolton Hill, where they have three very nice cafes, which I frequent, and I walk. I don't drive there because it's too, <laughs> too uh, 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 close to drive to. All right. I also do walk up to Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't mind Pennsylvania Avenue. I do, uh, uh, do not like uh, what goes on on Pennsylvania Avenue, but you know, there is a market that I go to, all right? Uh, there is another Chinese food establishment that I go to, all right? And so uh, I, they're walkable to me. Uh, there is a food establishment that I go to, which is over on McMeckin Street to gro do grocery shopping. How That's far walkable. away are these establishments that you travel to? Uh, the grocery store, save a lot, is uh, three blocks away. All right, Pennsylvania Avenue for me is three blocks away. All right, uh, there is another grocery store that is one block away. All right, so all of these grocery stores uh, are one block away. Uh, and I am looking forward to the opening of the Bethel Empowerment Center where they will have also a cafe. All right, and I know that there will be a cafe that is right across the street from me that I'll be able to go and sit, have a cup of coffee meet with folks and do those things that I realize are being projected for this place also. And what, what's the projection time for that? Um, they are in the process right now. All right. They were waiting for funding. Uh, they have been awarded, you know, uh, funding. All right. And so hopefully, you know, what they are talking about was in the next year or two. All right. And so we, we are looking forward to that. 
uh, in that cafe opening so that there is, you know, something close by, which I will appreciate. Uh, my wife is, you know, homebound or in a wheelchair. That would be handy for her, uh, something close by. All right. Uh, and so um, this I might think. might even be closer, right? Huh? What Ms. Halstead is proposing oh, might would, even be that closer. That would be closer, but not what I'm looking for. You know, I'm looking for the first one to come up. I would have to wait. I'm not sure how long I have to wait for this one. And she says two or three years, too. All right. And, and that may be possible, but that's not what I'm looking for. I live in that block. And, and you must understand, I live in that block. I understand, sir. All right. And I realize that that is going to be inundating my block where I live, where I have invested all right, in two properties. And so I'm not looking for greater density in my block. I'm looking to be able at least one property all right, to gain you know, some income off of that property. All right, and I want, to, and I don't want that property to be multifamily. It will not be multifamily, okay. And so uh, 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 I'm looking for a neighborhood that is designed in a way that we don't have that kind of crowd of business there, all right, because that is, you know, something that the density of that brings other problems. I realize that even in Bolton Hill, those establishments have been robbed. All right, uh, armed robbery in those establishments. It's all over the city, isn't it? Hmm? That's happening all over the city. All over the absolutely, absolutely. But when it's going to get closer to my block. <laughs> it happened in Bolton Hill. Now understand now, it happened in Bolton Hill. I don't like that because I, I frequent those establishments. I don't want to be in there when it gets robbed, and I don't want anybody to be robbed down in my block. All right, uh, we've already had you know uh, other incidents in, on our block, uh, which I you know have problems with. Uh, I am involved in uh, by monthly or um, quarterly cleanups in my block, or in my community. We do quarterly cleanups, all right, where we try to pull as many residents together to do cleanups, all right. And so I'm very concerned about trash in my block, all right. Uh, uh, I'm very concerned about trash and anything that brings trash. We had problems before that we addressed to Bethel, all right, in its new, you know, uh, uh, proposal, that we had problems with trash in the past. We don't want that to end up again, this problem. We solved that problem. We don't want to end up again with a trash problem. And you've made your concerns about trash clear to Ms. Halstead, correct? Oh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. And to all the other developers that come by? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you ever had a case of a developer just ignoring you and letting trash yes. fester? Yes. That's what we're trying to prevent. Uh, we, we have developers who come in, you know. Was that developer Ms. Halstead? No. Okay. No. Um, as I said, Ms. Halstead came in and just opposed the, the protocol that we have said Ms. Hall used to serve on our board. We heard about the protocol. Right. And so she was supposed, and that, that's all that was about. And so um, other than that, uh, 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 you know, Ms. Halstead is what I consider a good neighbor, all right, a very good neighbor. I consider the things that she has done is admirable, all right, and she has achieved great success. However, great success does not satisfy my concerns. I realize that great success, you know, is something that she has been able to achieve, all right? And I realize that developers who are self-interested are not only really not just concerned about community. They're concerned about their own, you know, profit. And so, Mike. Quick question about the, about the parking. Um, do you, you said you live closest to the house and that is the property that's going to be on McCullough or? McCullough. Yeah, I live at 1416. That property is 1434. I live at 1416. Okay. And so the, and that property is on a corner, and it looks like there's a bunch of or a number of vacant properties close to that property. Is that correct? In our block, there are one, two, three, four vacant properties in our block right now, four vacant properties. So is there a problem with parking at this point? I, I know you mentioned Bethel, but... There's a, yeah, there's a part, because what it is, um, there are one, two, three, four, five homeowners in my block, five homeowners. Everything else is multifamily, and there are generally, you know, multi-cars, all right? Uh, there is no off-street parking, and so there are times, and, and I must say, I'm, I'm, I was blessed, unfortunately, by the fact that my wife has a disability where we're able to get disabled parking, so I'm not having problems with parking. My neighbors do, all right? And particularly, you know, if you <laughs> go out on a Sunday, all right, you're not gonna get back in your block, you know, until Sunday afternoon. 
all right, you're not going to get back in your block. So we realize that that's a problem in our, in our community parking. So our community has always had parking problems, and this is only going to exacerbate it as we see it. All right, as we see it as a community, this is only going to exacerbate it. And so uh, 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 I think that our opposition all right, is not in opposition to Ms. Halstead or the things that she is doing. Our opposition is into what is best for the community what will be best for the community, not for any one individual in the community, but for the community as a whole, what you, will be best for the community. Do you believe that each of these projects is not what's in the best interest for the community? Um, you can say, put them up if you believe one is, one isn't. But let, let me say that the one nearest to me, no. Sure. Uh, the one on Druid Hill, all right, no. Uh, the one in on Edding Street, now, there's no development around Edding Street. We realize on Division Street, there is an empty, vacant lot there that is going to be developed in the future. Uh, we know that that will be also a potential problem. So I can't say at this time that it is not going to be a problem. And, I, and in, in the survey, I said that I could not be opposed to it because I you know, see things in the future. All right, so therefore, I was neutral all right, in, the, in, the, in the question. So um, my opposition you know, s simply is community concerns. All right, community concentric, community development, and what is best for community. All right, and not in the interest of any one person, individual. It's what is best for our community. And, and let me ask you on, on that point. Um, you had 15 folks attend the meeting with Ms. Halstead, mm -hmm. and so it's in, it, it's important to you as to what those folks believe. Absolutely. And, and their Absolutely. concerns or support or non-support. Right? Absolutely. Now. My, my concern with the, with the survey is, and you'll notice that there were a number of folks who did not live directly in the community or who represented other community uh, associations. Uh, and so, you know, therefore, you know, there was a... Wait, 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 wait a minute. This is a document you presented to me. Yes. Right? And you presented it as a, a survey that would be helpful for us to consider? It was comfortable for me, yes. If, if you understand, you know, what I'm saying. It, it is... Well, but I, I ask you, what is it? You mm -hmm. said it's a, a document that was generated as a consequence of the meeting that you had, right? Yes. And 15 people attended the meeting, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you, wanted to, you wanted to get the pulse of those folks as to what their feelings were about this project or this set of projects. Is that right? Um, I wanted to get the pulse basically of those who lived in the community. Yes. Okay. That's correct. And these 15 people who showed up? They did not live in the community, and all of them did not live in the community. Okay. Okay. So I, I, Is it important to you what those folks thought about the projects? Outside the community? Presenting? They were invited to the meeting, right? Our meetings are open meetings, sir. Our meetings are open meetings. You know, whoever comes, comes. Okay, so, you know, uh, uh, there's a membership. But, but you thought this was important for us to have? Absolutely. Okay. Because I wanted you to see that the obje objectivity of where we were on that, that's all. The objectivity. So it's important for us to take into consideration that on each of these projects, the majority of folks who are at the meeting either support or strongly support the project? And I wanted you to take into consideration, as I said just now, that there are some folks who do not live directly in the community okay. uh, and who will not be impacted as we are. I just want to be clear what this is. You're clear. And that you felt it was important that we you're have cl it. You're clear. You're clear. All right. Okay. And so, you know, uh, our opposition, uh, as you see that our letter is not in opposition. <laughs> okay. Our letter is not in opposition. And we have it and we'll consider it. I'm giving you our concerns. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey. Hello. Hi, state your name, please. My name is Dexter Parker. Okay, Mr. Parker. D-E-X-T-E-R-P-A-R-K-E-R, -E -E simple enough. I um, live in the community. Um, I live at 1502 McCullough Street, which is about two doors down from one of the proposed uh, buildings. I recently learned about the building, but I want to give you a little bit of history first. <laughs> um, when my husband and I moved to this community 25 years ago, it was with the hopes that it would become um, a place that we could retire, and I'm getting emotional. Didn't mean to do that. Um, sorry. A place that we could retire, and we worked very diligently in changing the landscape of the community. I'm sorry, I want to, want to cut you off. Are you in opposition? Or are you I am in opposition, yes. Um, we worked very diligently to change the community. Uh, when we moved into the, the neighborhood, uh, there were drug dealers, there was trash everywhere, and um, he and I would clean up the streets, plant flowers, 
put flowers on the front to change the perception of where we lived. We called the cops on the drug dealers until they stopped showing up. And um, you know, with hopes of bringing more home ownership to our neighborhood. It's a beautiful block. I don't know if you've ever seen 1500 block of McCullough Street. It has two keyhole openings, which is architecturally interesting and quite stunning. The houses themselves are beautiful. Um, currently, I live across the street from a church um, and another commercial building coming very soon. Um, there are, there is a VFW post on one corner. Um, there are a countless number of corner stores. The home ownership that we were hoping for seems to be taken over by transient residents that are now in these multifamily uh, dwellings. A lot of times the neighbors, uh, the buildings have become unkempt because the owners don't live in the neighborhood. The residents don't care about the neighborhood like a homeowner would. If you ride up the odd side of McCullough Street in the 15, 1400 block, and you just look at the number of trash cans that are in the alley, the amount of trash that's left in the alley and unclean. I can't blame the homeowners that don't live there. I can only blame who lives there, which are people who don't really care about our community. So to have additional multifamily buildings come and properties to continue to happen around us, it, for me, the reason that I moved there, it all just becomes a blur. And I mean, I believe in what she's doing. She has great vision for part of, you know, the, the neighbors, I mean, the uh, development projects that she's doing, the artist community. Um, parking, definitely at the top of the list. I work out of town in DC, and if I get home past a certain time, I have nowhere to park. I'm driving, you know, parking beside the church or, you know, not in front of my home. So parking is a concern. And, on my street, there are no, in front of my house, in front of my block, there are no houses in front of me. So all of the parking comes from the multifamily people. Both sides of the streets are parked, are filled, and there's only one side of the street that has houses. So parking is a big concern. If I leave with the go to, to the grocery store on Sunday and I have to take my car, when I come back, there no, there's nowhere to park. So I park blocks away from my house and carry my groceries or double park, unload my groceries, and find a park. A number of folks have said leaving on Sunday. What if you <sighs> shopped on another day when the church wasn't full? So, so I do that as well. But typically, I'm not at home to shop on a Sunday. Uh, on a weekday, I'm at work. So when I come home from work, the parks are taken if I get in before, uh, after 5.30, 6 o'clock. You know, I struggle to find a park. <clears throat> so I just wanted to say that although I believe in what she's doing, I'm not thrilled to have more commercial space in our block. I'm not thrilled to have more multifamily people in our block. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. I will be brief. Um, and I'll just go Siri item. You have to state your name again. Jules Dunham Howie. Do you spell it for me, please? J U L E S. D U N H A M H O W I E. Thank you. You're most welcome. And so, um, first of all, I want to say that um, we were grateful that the last meeting we came to, that it ended with um, us being able to get to a place where we could hear each other. And following that meeting, we came together, as you could see, and we did have a special called meeting. And that's why I think, you know, the numbers were what they were. But um, the bottom line is there was a robust exchange and it was positive. And that's actually all we wanted was to be able to make certain that community's voice could be heard by this particular developer and that any issues could be heard. And what kept bubbling up every time and, and, and we shared with you in the interest of transparency what the survey that was given, and we've also shared that with uh, Ms. Halstead, uh, is that, you know, the community was very concerned over and over and over again about the same several issues, which you've heard, parking, trash, rodents, 
And then, interestingly enough, site management. And that came from the conversation. Because when you talked about, when we talked about um, the Edding Street properties, uh, there were just basic questions that couldn't be answered. The question was asked, density. How many stalls are going to be in here? How many people are going to be working in the co-location -lo working space? And just basic operational questions. And they could not be answered. And actually, the answer that was given took us aback. Because the answer was, I'm a developer. I don't know those things. OK, but you want community to support you. And you want community to get on board with you for a project, and you can't tell us what the impact of this project is really going to be for our neighborhood. You don't know who the operator is. You don't know the hours. You don't know how many stalls of food we asked for. And that's actually one of the reasons why we said, can we do a community benefits agreement to be able to alleviate some of the issues that community may have about these things because they're at the table. So when we asked in this community benefits agreement for there to be an opportunity for the community to sit at the table so we could talk about f a comprehensive food waste and food delivery system, that came directly from the community. They're saying, you're talking about having all these stalls, wonderful, all this food, wonderful, but we're concerned about rats. We're concerned about trash. We're concerned about how are you going to be, what's the loading dock? Where is that going to be? How is it going to impede the new 10 apartments that you're putting on Druid Hill Avenue? I mean, these are all just spatial, realistic questions that are natural in development. Furthermore, you actually want to be able to capitalize this project. We're not quite sure how you're going to be able to capitalize it if you can't articulate all of the components of what you're trying to do to community even. So that was an issue with the Edding Street property that came up over and over. Site management, site control, just site operation. It's unclear. It's very fuzzy. It's a wonderful concept. Love the concept, but community would like to be engaged. Secondly was the issue with the um, with the Druid Hill building. And, and, and Atiba said it well. You know, the, the concept is wonderful, but there is a question about competency because that building not only had a, a previously $100,000 in stabilization from Baltimore City DHCD, and it went to a developer. And then that developer promised us to give us the moon and ultimately walked away because they wanted 15 units. And the community said no, and you all gave a variance for 10. So they could do 10, and they couldn't get a variance for more. They walked away, and it sat. And that's given us the blight. Well, you know. This developer was privy to so those, those conversations with community, came in and bought the property, which is fine, but it sat after she bought the property for several years and there was a fire. And, after, and then the community found out, as it was, we said, it wasn't well secured. So the fire happened. We found out there was no insurance. So that raises a whole lot of questions. You're sitting here with a huge swath of real estate on Druid Hill Avenue, and you don't have it insured as a developer. And now you have a fire, and you have to do a GoFundMe page to pay for your insurance. That's a concern. So naturally, community has these issues. But all of these things can be addressed if we're in communication and working together. And so that's where the community benefits agreement came back again. We said, clearly, our goal, and, and I appreciate the fact that she went back to 2005's master plan, but 2026 master plan, which was adopted in 2018 by the planning department, said our focus is a number one issue is home ownership in this community. And so when she, when she came to the table and said she wanted to do 10 units, and we said, well, look, is there an opportunity where five years, seven years down the road, you could take that and turn it into co-ops? It could be an artist co-op where they could actually own something now as artists, or it could actually be turned into condos for artists. Would you consider that type of thing? Those are the types of communications that we in community were trying to facilitate and have. And the last one is, which is the one you're re we're really here about today, which is 1434 McCullough Street in terms of the variance that's being requested. And you all know it well, and you know the code well. The code says she can have two, she's seeking three. Well, the number one issue that came up around that was that there is a 20,000 square foot facility directly across the street from this building 
which is the Bethel Empowerment and Wellness Center, which is slated to open in the first quarter of 23, which will have a commercial kitchen and a full cafe. So that is already going to be there. Right at the end of the corner is a bodega already, or what do you call a, a, a corner store? <laughs> okay, and so and then to one a block and a half around the corner is another community store. So to create another community store when in in cafe when we have a brand new cafe that's being built in community, it seemed redundant, and the major concern was parking. Because when the, when the Empowerment and Wellness Center comes online, there are going to be all these agencies, there are going to be all these activities going on in the community, and that is going to bring a lot of traffic into the community beyond what we currently have. And as you've heard from a couple of homeowners, which I am in that very block, I'm in the 1500 block, this is in the 1400 block. So you, you can't park. My husband refused to move the vehicle. He won't go nowhere. He's like, I'm not going because I'm not losing my parking space. So parking is a tremendous issue in our neighborhood. And so we are asking for you not to support that particular variance to allow this particular usage where it's going to require another parking um, space. We're saying, please, you can support it. Support it within the code. The code says she can have two, so she could do two units. That would also potentially address the community's issue with density. Because if you look in our neighborhood, the number one issue is that we have so many multifamilies, and a lot of them are being used as halfway houses. And so you have all of these transients and transient individuals with transient vehicles and everything else in the community. And so those were some of the issues and concerns that have come up. But I have great hope that. We are not only going to be able to, to continue dialogue, we are going to be able to champion and support this initiative and effort within community. Because we want growth and we want development. The question is, how does that growth and development actually happen in partnership with community? And why did the document, was the document only received today? Because we had a week and this is community. The benefit we had to research, we do have other MOUs with developers, by the way. We actually do have community benefits agreements with developers throughout Upton. And we have the, the agreements that actually are about real money, money that is committed from developers to the community to support our community reinvestment fund. We weren't asking for dollars here. We're asking for being, the ability to be at the table in partnership. So yes, Ms. Halstead's correct. She received it this morning. It wasn't 30 minutes before the meeting. It was emailed to her this morning because it was completed, <laughs> but because it actually went out to the board, and the board had to provide feedback. And it's a community board, and it was a holiday. So we did the best we could in a week. But I think we did a yeoman's job in a week. And our desire was to be able to say, look, we want to work together, but we are asking to you, for you to alleviate community concern by allowing community to continue to be at the table with you as you work to move these projects forward. And it's my hope that the board can understand that, that we've approached this from a good faith effort, and that we are determined that the work that happens in Marble Hill will be a success, and that it is all for the greater good. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Does that conclude the uh, opposition? All right, Ms. Holstead? Um, I don't know, do you want me to go through well, you line have the final, item? Yeah, if, if there's anything you'd like to either rebut or, or just have the final word with regard to. Um, I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen any other community benefits agreement for anyone else. Um, the process is uneven, let me say that. Um, Bethel Empowerment and Wellness Center is uh, not very many people are excited about it because um, it's a lot of services and we don't want more services in the neighborhood um, like counseling or like that sort of stuff we want food we want spaces to hang out and we want to hang out with our neighbors and have more people move in um, I don't even know. I mean, I could. One quick question uh, yeah. about the parking. Um, just for our standards, what, what exactly would you say, in your opinion, is unique about 
the McCullough, 1434 McCullough um, building that requires it to have the three as opposed to just the two. And for our records, um, there's still only two that's provided, correct? At this yeah, point, variance of one. Right, I guess the variance that was requested for that was one parking variance because you have two available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, unless I ask someone to, you know, only smart cars get to move in and then there's room for four, you know. Um, so what's unique about it? The layout, actually, um, that it's already been a multifamily. Um, if you saw the building, you would just, if you care about architecture or space or ceiling height or windows or staircases, um, any of it it's it's gorgeous um and it's it's laid out in a way that that makes sense you know it just it it makes sense and again it also helps to fund uh the grocery right the cafe so two units could do it um barely or if at all right I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't make it, but three units would be something that that makes sense. Um, I think I sent you the drawings. Is that true? For the you know, so you can see um, how the space is laid out. I don't know if you can read them, but um, but you can see how the space is laid out, and that in some ways it just makes sense. Um, and that it's that it's doable i mean that that the variance is possible right i mean i don't know how you know i, I mean yeah that it's possible absolutely possible um the building was so so go ahead, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. oh no sorry i was already thinking about a different building That's okay. but so 1426 was so degraded um i couldn't get uh insurance on it until I had builder's insurance. And because I didn't have the permits yet, um, I could not, until I didn't, I could not get the insurance. Yeah, somebody torched it. I got it in April of last year in July after a very contentious board meeting, somebody torched it. I'm not saying that those two things are related. I'm just saying those things happened. And that was really stressful. I don't even know what to say super stressful so yes now we are working on it now it is insured um it wasn't it was a, it's just sort of like yeah on a super super rainy day somebody decides to go in and torch the area that is completely fallen in right so it's just i'm just saying super weird how it happened don't know how it happened nobody was interested in in looking into it um, whether it was squatters or someone else, I don't know. It's just super weird that, you know, these things happen after so long of sitting there. Um, so that was really frustrating and super stressful. Now it's super exciting because you'll have these full floor lofts. Just, I just invite you to come through. So anyway, because it's really, it's going to be something. So it has three floors, is what you're... It has three floors. And each one would be a separate unit? Uh, it has two... Well, no. So, sorry, because I switched to 1426 Druid Hill Avenue. Okay. So 1434 Druid Hill Avenue is three stories. There are two... The first floor would be the cafe uh, which, with some grocery items um, because that has like 13, 14-foot ceilings and beautiful... Uh, medallions and plaster work that would be restored. The second and third floors, um, there would be one apartment on the second floor, one on the third floor that mirrors the, those two mirror each other, and then the third apartment would go from the second to the third floor up the back staircase. So there are almost a thousand square feet. I think they're 988 or something, 988 square feet. So each one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So they're already large one bedrooms. Yeah, they're massive one bedrooms. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm and again, it's not two and three bedrooms. Just as with the artist loft, they're not. I'm not putting four bedrooms in 1,200 square feet because that's how large 
those are, like f per floor, it's one, literally one bedroom. And in fact, it's more of, um, you know, the walls are up to, you know, wherever. I, I mean, it's, it's basically open space, right? So anyway, um, and then the food hall. I mean, I don't know. After that BBJ article came out, uh, you know, Donald Mannequin called, who is, who's with Seawall and is, did our house and like a bunch of other stuff. And they're my consultants. Like those are, I, I know those guys and, you know, not like I, I need, not like I'm saying we're partners, but in terms of how to make this happen, they're helping me make this happen. They're helping me understand how to do this because it's a great idea, right? It's not, it's not, I mean, yeah, do I have a vision about how this could be? Do I know absolutely every detail? Absolutely not. Would, would it be fair to say that the information that you've been able to provide them is the information that you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I don't hold the ball. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you've met me twice now. I mean, does it, you know? But it's like, I, if I have the information, I'm happy to provide that. I, I can get the information as we move along. My biggest thing is how to secure these properties and because I am not going to be the one that's, that's managing these, right? And I will be looking for someone who knows how to do this, you know, just like- with communities in doing that. Absolutely, yeah, but of course, but you know, I mean, there are, you know, as you see several naysayers um, and then you also have a lot of other people who are very, very supportive of this, that want this. And I don't know, in terms of the money, honestly, none of your business. I, it, it, I mean, it's not, it's not. You know, if I decided to, to sell a, a property I have somewhere and finance this thing, that's my business. If I want to panhandle on Pennsylvania Avenue and ask for a nickel to everybody who walks by, that's my business. Are the buildings being built? Yes. Am I in talks with lenders about where, about, you know, what, what interest rate and like, you know, do I need to get, you know, is it a, is it a five or seven year mini perm, right? Absolutely I am. But I don't have to get funding for these things right this second, right? Until the stabilization is done on 1426 Druid Hill Avenue, I'm not going to apply for funding. And guess what? That's what the lender suggested. And I also have another lender who's like, hey, Shelly, when are we gonna get going? Well, as soon as I get over zoning, then I will know. But I'm not going to do things, I don't do, I don't work like that, actually. So, um, I don't know anybody else who's doing this kind of work in this neighborhood, and we want it. I, I don't know anybody else, you know, and I don't know, I don't even know what to say. So you're, you're, you live in the community? Yeah, I live in, yeah, absolutely. I live Your on the block. The they live around the corner. Your view of the concerns uh, that the opposition has raised about parking? Uh, as and the impact that this project or these several projects will have on parking um, what do you say to that I say it's going to impact my parking as well but I also live in a city and when there are when there are people not living in houses then there's tons of parking right but if everybody were living in in the houses that we have you know or like total health care they come in and fill up a bunch of parking all the churches, they fill up a bunch of parking. You know what I mean? Some people have parking in the backs, right? Like you go down the alley and you can see so-and-so's car back there, right? So I don't have that, but I also live in a city, you know? And so I'm like, that's what happens in cities. It is, that's what happens in cities. You start, when, when more people move here, which is, God, isn't that what we want in Baltimore? To have more people move here? It's like dip below 600,000. Have you seen your tax bills recently? Like, you, we need more people. 
We need more investment. And that's what I want to do. So yeah, is there park, are there parking issues? I don't know. Do I move on Sunday? Absolutely not. Nope, I don't. I don't move my car on a Sunday because there's a bunch of churches, you know? Um, you know, these are supposed to be pedestrian friendly. Um, I want that to be. I want to get out and ride my bike. Not everybody's going to do that, right? But um, I think most people are going to be like com community, like, like community. I, that word is going to wear me out. But, you know, community members, people who live around here, right? That's the idea. That's the goal is to get people activated and out in the neighborhood. All those houses that, that, that the nonprofit is building up and down this corridor between Druid Heights and Upton, all those people are gonna walk, walk. They're gonna walk down there. They're not gonna drive, right? They're gonna walk Edding Street, which turns into a little alley. They're gonna walk by the mosque, by the park, right? By the barber shop, and they're gonna come. Right, people are going to come up. Druid Hill, people are going to come over. People from Bolton Hill are going to come over, Madison Park, and they're going to walk. Because you know why? Because they might be just like the neighbors. Oh, there's probably not any parking there. Oh, and it's safe now because there's so many people on the street. So that's how I see it. That's how I envision it. I, everything, I, I try to do, um, I try to make happen. And again, if I have to force people to walk or they get a quarter off their cup, you know, for walking to instead of driving, then, you know, so they get a quarter off their cup of coffee. I don't know. I don't drink coffee, but whatever. <laughs> okay. You know? All right. Anyone have any questions no. for Ms. Halstead? No. No. Right. Anything else, ma'am? I don't know. Take right. a second. This is Thank your last. You so much. This is the end. I know. This is this is the end. Take a second. Mm. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Um, it's also okay if there isn't anything. That's fine too. No, I don't think so. Okay. I just. It's just it isn't just me that wants these things. And to question my commitment to community and say it's about putting it in my pocket is just rude and wrong. Everything I have done since I moved to Baltimore has been about rebuilding this city. Everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's now we're moving on to deliberations and we'll go all three. I can kind of do so, um, Do you all have the standards in front of you? I have the copy. I have mine. Yeah. All right. So starting, I guess, with um, Edding Street first. Again, to, to go back, this is neighborhood commercial restaurant, neighborhood commercial office. And then um, because the office space is a little bit larger, they do need a four space off street parking variance for that, along with the two conditional uses. The good thing about all three of these is that we don't have to flip to the variance page at all. It's all conditional. Well, no, there's, there's an off street parking uh, four space variance for the office. For the off for that? Yeah, oh, because it's, it's, yeah, um, it's over 2,500 square feet. Oh, I just, I was saying that just because they're all listed on the notes you gave us. They're all oh. just conditional uses. None of them. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's the, okay. the third one is off-street parking variants. Okay. So then if everybody could be quiet in the, the audience because he has, this is all being recorded. So the deliberations are recorded. So if you guys need to talk, if you wouldn't mind taking it outside while we deliberate. Thank you. So um, I think that if we look at, well, let's take the first two then, the, the conditional uses as a, for, for Edding Street. The first two are restaurant and office, right? Um, and the questions that are presented before us is: Would it, would anything about this be detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare? I can say no to that. Um, 
with the conditional use, is it precluded by any law or urban renewal plan? No. I'm going to skip question three for a second because that's the public interest one. So question four is, would it be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the code? And I would say yes. But I think that the debate on this one is having to do with the public interest. And what we've heard is, um, I guess actually this one's the, of the three, this is the least contentious one, right? This is the one that um, mm -hmm. is the food hall. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think, and you guys obviously will weigh in as well, I don't think that it's contrary to public interest in this one. I don't think that we've heard the word edding brought up a lot in the, the uh, opposition at all in terms of this one specifically being opposed to public interest. What do, what do you what do you say? Uh, I, I would agree with that conclusion. Um, the applicant, you know, set forth why it would fit and actually work within this community uh, because of some things that they're lacking. Yeah. Um, and so that in and of itself uh, is for public interest. Uh, there's testimony from the opposition that uh, similar establishments you know, they walk to other locations. Like Mount Vernon Marketplace. Sure, sure. So, you know, this one would be, you know, in the neighborhood and, and certainly would serve that purpose for those, uh, you know, who care to frequent that. And I think that, I don't think that the, the I don't even think we reach the, the Schultz Pritz standard, but I don't, I don't think that we can deny this use because I don't think that it has adverse effects above and beyond it being anywhere else in this uh, part of the, the zone. Anybody else? No, I can I can make it um, even simpler than that for all three of the conditional use requests by um, looking at the criteria for denying that's right there in the yeah. code. Mm -hmm. yep, I and agree. I don't think the community association has met any of those criteria to deny. That's for all three. I for, agree. Including the parking one? Uh -oh, that's the a variance. Oh, well, let's, we can't do the properties for, because they each each has a different application. I'm talking t strictly to the conditional use. Yeah. All right. For, so, Edi for Edding Street, correct? For all three. <laughs> and we we hear you, Bill, but we're going <laughs> to say it three times. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be the same thing each yeah. time. Right. So yeah, you just, just have to record. say it say it three times. Yeah. Because it is three different applications. That's what I was saying. It's right. three different applications. Yeah. So we have to take them one at so, a time. So for this first one, there are two conditional uses and one variance. And what Bill said goes for the first two for the conditional uses and for all of the other reasons. And then if we look at the variance standards for the parking, Bill, that's the only reason that it's because there's this variance thrown in. Um, this is for f uh, for four spaces, for right. office yeah. use. Yeah, and remember the parking is only for the office, not for the restaurant. Right, um, and this is co-working office space. This isn't even like this is something where it's if you by work. live in a really small house nearby, yeah. you might even walk. So yeah. I don't think that four spaces is an unnecessary hardship, yeah. given that it is not on a Sunday when all the churches would be there anyway. <laughs> Maybe and. Um, so the first question is, is it unique to this property? And the answer is. I think what the board tends to do in cases like this is to talk about the as built condition of the property. So to, to reflect that there is no parking on site. And the building, so we're not gonna ask the applicant to demolish to part demolish of the building. Part of this big manufacturing warehouse structure to create four parking spots um, at this point. Yeah. Right. Begin, that's the topographical conditions or the yeah. shape of structure of the building. Um, and that would be an unnecessary hardship. And not having parking is not just to increase the value of it. Um, it's not injurious to the use of anyone else and it's in harmony with everything. Um, and it's not detrimental to public health or safety or welfare. Uh, I guess I would add that given that this property is located in a CHAP district, uh, the developer may not be able to demolish the property oh, or, or alter the property in order to create new parking on site. And I don't think we heard much testimony in opposition either to the conditional use aspect for adding as well as the variant. Um, and, it, and I guess the state and generally, it was not opposition per se to the project. Not to adding in the same way. Right. For all of those reasons, I am a yes for the for the Edding Street property. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. I'm a yes for the conditional use and a yes for the variance. 
this then we gotta say something else. This as well. Okay, okay so great. Five, five yeses, all three requests. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, 1426 Druid Hill has just one conditional use and it's for neighborhood commercial art gallery. Bill, what was that you said again? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the record. I know, I know, but Bill's so trying to move us along, but we yeah, can't. I, I really am. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I said before, you know, it's very clear. There's limit, cr limited criteria for denying, and the evidence com um, presented by a community association doesn't meet that standard. I'm a yes for that reason as well. I'm a yes. Is this a Sam off? So a yes. This is well. All right. That's five yeses for. Gallery. Um, Hill. And then for McCullough Street, it's back to being split. There are two conditional uses and then one variance. Um, I'm going to go with the variance first just because it's a parking variance again. Again, it is only a one space variance. So I do not think that um, it, uh, it, it rises to the level of an unnecessary hardship or anything like that. It is one parking space. Again, looking at the the condition of the property, I think that um, there's nowhere to put it in a townhouse, yeah. right? Awesome and, and I think um, Otis yeah. asked even at the end, you know, about the the layout and the the building. There, yeah, the layout space for two spots. There's already space for two, two parking spots, but not three. And I think it's also unique because it is an end unit. It looks like we used as a church before, yeah. as opposed mm -hmm. to some of the other houses. And it's like a, a part that abuts. That goes out. It looks like it's probably even larger than some of the other houses. Another if you look prayer. at the overhead, yeah. you can see where the two go. Yeah. Um, in the back. Yeah. It's a funky shape. Yeah. 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 Um, and then for the reasons mentioned of in the previous two for conditional use, um, I would adopt those <laughs> same reasons. <laughs> for that reason, I'm a yes for the two conditional uses and the variance for the 1434 McCullough Street property. I'm a yes. I'm also a yes. Uh, I'm a yes. I, I think the uh, variance standards uh, have been, the applicant has demonstrated uh, that we, she meets those standards uh, for the variance and, and also for conditional use. And I, and I think that, w once again, just to reiterate, I don't think that there is enough information as presented from the people in opposition to, to be able to deny this conditional use. And just so that they're clear that um, the conditional uses are presumed to be allowed in the first place, so that, that it is their burden to pre present something that would state that is not allowed for the conditional uses. I have one question with that. Do we want to consider any of the conditions that they have in the community benefit agreement? I think that the oh, applicant has made it clear that she did not want to sign that, so we can't. No. Let me just say something uh, mm -hmm. for the record. One, I'm really impressed with the um, applicant and I'm really impressed with her proposals. And um, if she's working with Seawall in any way, shape, or form, um, that means she wants to get this thing done. Yeah. I parrot that one. I, did, I haven't seen, evinced any intent, anything other than to work for the community and to better the community by these uh, presentations. And so uh, I just wanted to add that for the record. And there's no evidence that she's not capable of this. In fact, I think that the evidence, if anything, would tip the scales in favor of her being capable of doing these three projects. All right, next. Yeah. All right, so just, just before we finish, was there, or I guess what he's saying is in other times we have put conditions on. So what we're hearing from the rest of the board members is no one has an interest in putting any condition on this condition. Not this time. No. Okay. And I agree with that. I just wanted to put that on the record. Right. No, um, it's yeah. good to have the discussion because uh, it's something that we've done in the past. Even when there isn't an agreement, sometimes the board will put conditions on because of information that they've heard. Yeah. So the, it was a good question to raise. The board does have the authority to put any kind of condition that's related to public health, safety, and welfare on the approval. But if you don't want to, then you don't have to. You don't have to. All right. Great. All right. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, so now we're moving on to the rest of the docket. Um, before we move on to the consent I docket, we need a break. Sure, but what we'll do is, um, yeah, that's we'll fine. Line everybody up and have them. Yeah. Right now. So, um, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take a break for five minutes. Everybody, we'll give you go to the bathroom, get warm for two seconds, and and come on back in, and we'll start with the consent docket. It is cold. 
Uh, we should be. Information to approve the appeal requested. Uh, so I will call those cases, ask you to line up in front of me, uh, and then along the dais to my left. Uh, we'll call your case number, we'll hear reports from planning and staff, and then we will uh, resolve your particular case. All right, so in this order, um, calling case number 2022-201, 833 Holland Street, Martin Marin. Case number 2022-202, 1602 through 1604 Blossom Street, uh, Caroline Hecker. Uh, case number 2022-203, east side of South Haven Street, section of O'Donnell Street, Ms. Hecker as well. Uh, case number 2022-205, 1125 Harlem Avenue, Olad Oladipo, uh, Kolowo, Amasu. Appreciate my efforts there. Uh, <laughs> case number 2022-209, 2324 East Monument Street, Thatch Lee. If you all make sure you're in the order that we call you. Case number 2022-211, 1915 Drew Hill Avenue, Gwadi, Halle Michael. All right. Case number 2022-212, 30 West 25th Street, QPS Inc. So the gentleman for both uh, 30 West 25th and 26 West 25th, he went to feed his meter. Okay. He'll be right back. No, we'll just put him at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Case number 2022-216, 1116 Homewood Avenue, Mia Rogers. Case number 2022-217, 1118 Homewood Avenue, Mia Rogers as well. Case number 2022-218, Western Side Craddock Avenue, 339, what is this, feet. <laughs> <laughs> and half feet northeast, Cold Spring Lane, Cherie Loudon. Uh, 2022-219, West Side Craddock Avenue, 365 feet, 11 northeast, Cold Spring Lane, Miss Loudon as well. And 2022-250, 2235 North Fulton, Lance Decker. We can swear them all in. Just remind me to call the last one. I do. Support. Oh, that one, yeah. Okay. So we'll start with case 2022 202 201, 833 Holland Street. Mr. Marin? Yes. Oh, welcome, sir. This uh, matter addresses a height variance to construct an 800-square-foot, two-story residential detached garage. Second floor will be an art studio. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Uh, here from planning and staff. So just to confirm, it's it's an art studio for the occupant. It's not an art studio art studio. Like personal you would use. think, you know, personal art studio. Use. Personal it's a per use. Yeah, there you go. It's a personal <laughs> use. All right. So the two things before the board are variances. Um, accessory structure height variance. 15 feet is allowed, 21 feet is proposed, so it's a six foot variance to height. Rear at setback, 25 feet is required, zero is proposed, so it's a 25 foot variance requested. The planning department reviewed this application and has no objection to approval of an art studio as a type of home occupation to be operated and maintained in accordance with subsection 15-507 of the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Mayor, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time, sir? No. All right. <laughs> You're just dying to prolong your time <laughs> here. So um, with that, sir, I can tell you that the board, having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thanks so okay. much, and thank, thank you for your patience. All right. That no was kind of emphatic, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Ms. Hacker. Good afternoon. Uh, so we're calling case number 2022-202, 1624 through 1604 Blossom Street, 
And this matter uh, seeks, addresses uh, raising the existing building, which is currently being used as a warehouse with accessory office and yard storage, and constructing new 14,400 square foot structure for the same uses requiring minimum front yard setback variance. Is that correct? Yes, uh, for the record, Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg, on behalf of the applicant. I'm joined by Angela and Rob McGuire of McGuire Plumbing and Heating, the applicant. Very well. All right, do we have uh, any reports from uh, planning and staff? Sure, so we have one variance. It's a front yard setback. 10 feet is required, 8 feet is proposed, so it's a two-foot variance. Just note that the warehouse and office use are allowed by right in an I-2 industrial zoning district. Okay. And the planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Ms. Hecker, is there anything you'd like to add to your application this time? Just a couple of exhibits to supplement your file. There's okay. a large copy of the site plan and a few other items in there. Very well. All right. Thank you. Uh, that said, the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ms. Hecker, while we have you, we'll have you for case number 2022-203. Uh, and I... Am I saying this right? It's the east side of yes. South Haven yes. Street, section of O'Donnell Street. And uh, this matter addresses, uh, I guess, the subdivision of the property, which was rezoned to C3 into three parcels, consolidating the southernmost parcel with a portion of the Boston Street right of way and construct a Quickway Japanese hibachi so. sleep number retail goods establishment and a Starbucks carry out food shop, which will um. include a drive. This is maybe it's overly just signs. inclusive. Okay. It's just, it's just, just the signs it's associated just the signs. with it. It's just the signs. It's right. Yeah. I mean, appreciate the effort, James. Um, but yeah, but what? So okay. I call them as I read them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, signs. Signs related to that project. You right. Related described. to that project, and yeah. we'll hear from planning and staff. So we have a wall. So, so that was a lot of everything that's going on. But we have wall signage proposed for the restaurant, retail goods establishment, carry out cafe with accessory drive through. So there are three sign area variances. The first one, maximum sign area variance, 25 square feet is allowed. 38.67 square feet is proposed. So it's a 13.67 square foot variance requested. Second one, sign area variance, 25 square feet is allowed. 46.8 square feet is proposed, so it's a 21.8 square foot variance requested. Third one, 25 square feet is allowed, 82.89 square feet proposed, so it's 57.89 square foot variance. Just note for the board, there's no maximum number that the board has to hit when we're talking about sign area variances. Okay. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. Ms. Hecker, is there anything you'd like to add to your application, ma'am? have a series of exhibits to supplement your record. There's a letter of support in there from the Canton Community Association and Brewers Hill neighbors as well. Awesome. Very well. Uh, well, with that, the board having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Case number 2022-205, 1125 Harlem Avenue. Um, sir, could you say your name for the record? Uh, my name is Olarapo Kolawale Amosu. Okay. Spell that for me, please. We have it on here. <laughs> we have it on here. I have it. Yep. Oh, oh, never mind. Forget that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for that. Uh, that was really for my benefit. All Thanks, right. sir. <laughs> <laughs> this is a request to use the premises as a multifamily dwelling consisting of three dwelling units. Correct? That's correct. All right. I'll hear from uh, staff and planning. So the... It's essentially an affirmation of the existing three dwelling units. Um, the research indicates that the BMZA approved three dwelling units in 1954, which was again affirmed in 1961. In 1966, the city issued a vacant building notice. In 2002, the owner submitted a request to reduce from three dwelling units to a single family. However, the single family occupancy was voided and never issued according to our records. Another vacant building notice was issued in 2006. Um, it indicates the appellant has owned the property since 2001. The application states he has maintained it as three dwelling units since he required it. All units have separate gas, electric meters, HVAC water tanks. Um, and it's uh, unclear that there's, says there's more than enough space for parking of two to four vehicles in the rear. However, it's unclear if those parking spaces could be legal under the code or not. So essentially what we have is a minimum lot area variance and two off-street parking. So um, the minimum lot size would be 
Well, first, you have, first we have to, so it was the last legal authorized use we have is three dwelling units. So if you affirm the last legal authorized use is three dwelling units, we don't necessarily have to get to the variances requested. All right, so, but what I will tell you is we did receive a letter from the Harlem Park Neighborhood Council. And essentially what it said, hold on, as I reel in my mouse here, um, that the Harlem Park Neighborhood Council is not in support or denial of the continued use of 1125 Harlem Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland to be used as a multifamily dwelling consisting of three units. We only received notification this hearing on Friday, 624. There's been no contact with HPNC regarding the proposal for this building. Since the applicant states in the application it's been three units for over 30 years and he acquired 20 years ago and has maintained it, what is the appeal for? To our knowledge, there has not been a sign posted for the hearing and the HPC cannot support or deny something that we have no information on. Now we did receive um, an affidavit that the sign was posted. So I'd like to confirm, sir, that you had the sign posted on your property for 21 days? Yeah, the, the sign has been posted since, uh, I believe it was June the 4th. Yeah, and it's still there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. Yeah, so. And I was, I, was, I was there on Friday to, okay. we, to we, take we a picture. That. Okay, sir. Planning Department notes this property is located in the Harlem Park to Urban Renewal Plan area. That Urban Renewal Plan does not prohibit the proposed use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, sir, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, basically, I've owned the property and I've maintained it in good working condition and I have not done any alteration. It has been used as a three units constructed as a three units, I've not made any changes. And, um, you know, just want to be able to put it back to use. Very well. And the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank right. you. Great day. Case number 2022-209, 2324 Monument Street. That's Lee. Yes. Hi, how are you? Me. Uh, this is a request to use the second floor as a tattoo shop continue the nail salon on the ground floor, correct? All right. Uh, here, any reports from staff and planning? So we have a conditional use for personal services establishment and then a variance for off-street parking. One space is required, zero is proposed, so it's a one space variance. Property is located in the Middle East urban renewal area, which may impact the signage for a business. Planning department reviewed this application as stated by uh, BMZA staff, the property is in the Middle East Urban Renewal Plan area. The applicant is encouraged to consult that plan concerning any signs that may go up. The department has no objection to approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No. Very well. The board having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Can I just leave now? Yes, you may. <laughs> Run. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get out of the getting's good. Uh, case number 2022 216, 1116 Homewood Avenue. Nope, sorry, I skipped something. Uh, 20, 20, uh, 11, it's 211. Oh, sorry. Drew Hill. 2022 211, 1915 Drew Hill Avenue. Yes, yes. Gwadi Halen Michael. Yes. Okay, and this is a request to use the premises as three dwelling units, correct? All right, I'll hear from staff and planning. Uh, research shows that the research zoning records show that the property has been used for three dwelling units and MFD since 1957. Um, essentially, again, it's another one of those affirmations of the existing use. Okay. Planning department reviewed this application, noted this property is in the Druid Heights Urban Renewal Plan area. That plan does not prohibit or restrict the proposed use of the property. The department has no objection to the application. However, notes that if the board determines to approve the application, the department is recommending that approval of the application be subject to the condition that the use of this property complies with terms and conditions of the Baltimore City Code, Article 23, which is the sanitation article. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Highland Michael, are you in agreement with uh, that condition with regard to the sanitation article of the code? Yes, sir. All right. Is it is there anything else you'd like to add to your application at this time? Nothing. 
All right, the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, have a great day. Yeah, he's back. Yeah, the next yeah. one. Thinking. Okay, so we'll. I didn't. I didn't actually call both cases, or oh, he, line up. He's right there. I mean, your choice. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, he's back there. Uh, case number 2022-212, 30 West 25th Street. You can come right on up, sir. QPS Inc. Yes, sir. And you are? I'm Gene Blossom, representative for hey, the Keep company. your voice up, sir. Yeah, Gene Blossom, rep representative for the company. Okay. Could you spell your first and last name for me, please? Uh, okay, hold on. I got yeah, we're going to swear this gentleman no, because he wasn't here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Okay. And, uh, the request here is to use the premises as a daycare center for 12 children? Yes. All right, I'll hear from staff and planning. Uh, conditional use daycare for center for 12 children. Um, uh, information that the, the board may want to um, ask specifically about to the applicant is number of staff, pick up, drop off zones, things like that. Just is there anything you could add to your application on that? Uh, basically, we have. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's one more, one more person has to talk, and, oh, then, and then. I'm sorry. That, that was my note to the board, so I'd right. like them to ask you that. Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is located in the Charles and 25th Urban Renewal Plan area. That urban renewal plan does not prohibit or restrict the proposed use of the property. The department uh, does note that there is not a suitable location for drop off or pickup of children on this site. Um, and therefore encourages you to indicate to the board exactly how drop off and pickup of children would be handled. Subject to that, the department is recommending approval of the application. Thank you. Okay. Um, sir, could you explain to us about the drop off and pickup plans you have for this project? Yes, sir. Uh, there is a drop off and pickup uh, parking spaces or spots in the rear of the building. Um, there is sufficient enough parking at least that would hold at least maybe nine to ten cars drop off. Uh, that's uh, in accommodation to uh, 26, and also we have ownership of 30. So it's two lots, actually. So you have a parking lot that has 26 spaces? No. I'm that's sorry. The no, no, the that's the address. The address. <laughs> address 26 and address 30. All right, we're on 30 right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we have accommodation space for at least five to six spots in 30 and 20. Okay. I'll stop right there. Yeah, I don't want to know about 26 yet. <laughs> is this what the rear of your building looks like? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, that's it. Okay. It's pretty far back off of the alley. All right. Okay. Um, do you have any idea of the number of staff at this point? Uh, currently, we have three so far, three staff members. Um, we're still taking applications for others. Okay. And how many children will you have? Uh, Twelve. Is there an outdoor play area for this property? Uh, n not at this time, no. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I just have a point of clarification. Are these going to be separate child care centers? Separate, you gotta have 12 children? Mm -hmm. Well, because you, yeah. you're asking about 26 as well, now. Yeah, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Wait a minute. Because you've, do you have, you have, sir, you have two applications, one for 30 for 12 children and then one for 26, right. which is 12 children. So overall, both properties using, you're talking about 24 kids if you were to combine the two. Is that accurate? Or is it 12 for both properties? Well, it was 12 for both properties. So 12 it was, each. Yes, 12 each. So it's 26. Uh, there's 12 students. So separate child care. Separate, separate. separate child care centers. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, well, dealing with case number 2022-212. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add initially for that property? 30 West 25th Street. Same thing. Okay, uh, the board having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Now, formally calling case number 2022-213, 26 West 25th Street. 
QPS Inc. That's you. Uh, and again, this is a request to use the premises as daycare for 12 children at that location. Right. You're talking about 30. I'm talking about 26 West 25th oh. Street now. Yes, sir. We already we already have the uh, classroom space set up for 26. Same, for 26. Okay. And the parking space is in the rear of the building for 12 right. children. All right. That's great. Are there separate reports for for this property? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Identical report from planning also. Okay. And uh, so the parking, uh, the drop off and pick up. Drop off, pick up only. Is uh, is the same as you described in the prior case? Yes, sir. Okay. The same back of the building. Yes. And you expect these premises, the, these properties, and facilities to operate simultaneously, at the same time? Well, we're working on that factor. We don't know, so it's. We haven't actually began the full process yet. What we're doing, we're reaching out to the schools who have children that are falling behind, and we're enrolling as we speak. So hopefully, at some point, that could happen. Okay. All right. Well, any other questions from the board? No. no. All right. Board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Case number 2022-216, 1116 Homewood Avenue. Mia Rogers? Yes. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is a request to use uh, multifamily dwelling consisting of three dwelling units. You know what? Can I call both cases now? You can. Let's do it. <laughs> Amen. 2022-217 uh, as well. Uh, 1118 Homewood Avenue. And you are still Mia Rogers, right? Yes. Uh, and again, for this property uh, to use as multifamily dwelling consisting of three dwelling units. And I'll hear from staff and planning with regard to these properties. So again, we have another affirmation of um, existing properties. So for 2022-216-1116 Homewood, the land use history, zoning card information, 1957, three dwelling units, 1959, three dwelling units, 1963 dwelling units, 1961, three dwelling units. The property did go vacant in 2016. The last legal authorized use was as three dwelling units for 116 Homewood. Next one, 2022-217-1118 Homewood. Zoning history was 1948, three dwelling units, 1957, three dwelling units, 1959, three dwelling units, 1963 dwelling units, 1961, three dwelling units. So again, if the board finds that the last legal authorized use was three dwelling units, there's no need for a minimum lot area variance because it was an affirmation of the last legal authorized use. The planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property and the other property being heard simultaneously are in the Johnston Square Urban Renewal Plan area, and that that urban renewal plan does not prohibit or restrict the proposed use of the properties. The planning department is recommending uh, that if the, the board approves this application, it be subject to the condition that the property complies with the terms and conditions of Baltimore City Code Article 23, which is the sanitation code. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yes. With these are um, your properties with the multiple trash cans and um, multiple mailboxes out front. Yes. Okay. That was for the sanitation issue question. Thank yeah. you. Uh huh. All right, um, ma'am. Are you in agreement with the conditions with regard to the sanitation code? Yes. All right. Is there anything you'd like to add to your application? No. Nope. All right. Well, the board, having heard your appeal, we have. I believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal for 1116 Homewood Avenue and for 1118 Homewood Avenue. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, case number 22, 2022-218 uh, and <laughs> 2022-219, the first one, 2022-218, this west, west side, Craddock Avenue, uh, 339 feet, 5 northeast, Cold Spring Lane, you know, Cherie Loudon? Yes. All right. Uh, and this matter uh, addresses various bulk regulations related to the construction of a three-story semi-detached single-family dwelling with front-loading garage. All right. And 2022-219, West Side Craddock Avenue, 365 feet, 11, is Northeast Cold Spring Lane. Uh, similar uh, request, variance to bulk regulations related to construction of three-story semi-detached single-family dwelling with front-loading garage. Yes. Is that correct for both? All right, I'll hear from staff and planning. So just essentially you're building a duplex. Yes. 
Yeah, yes. she's building a duplex. So the zoning, the variance requests are essentially the exact same, just mm -hmm. one on on either side, right? Mm -hmm. yes. All right, so minimum side yard setback, 10 feet is required, eight and a half feet proposed. It's a one and a half foot variance requested for both properties, 2218 um, appeal number and 2219. Yes. Okay. Okay, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No, thank you. Thank you. The board, having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, finally, case number 2022-250, 2235 North Fulton. Uh, Lance Decker is here as the appellant, and you are? I'm Kate Brower. I'm with the Department of Rec and Parks in, on behalf of Lance Decker. Okay. Uh, do you need that last name spelled? Yes, please. Thank you. B as in boy, R-O-W-E-R. And this matter addresses a variance to bulk regulations related to the demolition of the existing recreation center to construct the new city-owned rec center. Is that correct? Correct. Great. Uh, hear from staff and planning. Mm -hmm. So the variance is requested. Off-street parking, one space per 1,000 square foot of public use area requires, um, based on the calculation, 17 spaces, zero are proposed, 17 space parking variance is requested. This is also conditional use as a government facility. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that all of the property uh, would be subject to this parking variance just described. The plan for the block on which this property is located includes pr uh, providing narrowing of Woodbrook Avenue to provide 16 angled parking spaces uh, right next to the property. The department also notes that this uh, new recreation center will have a positive impact in the Penn North community. The department recommends approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frank. Uh, Ma'am, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No. Very well. The board, having heard your appeal, we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, before we start on the regular docket, I received an email on 2022-208, which is 25 North Chester. If you recall, we were here to essentially pick up where we left off. The um, applicant contacted us and has had an emergency and had, was here earlier and had to leave. So we went ahead and um, rescheduled him for uh, 719. So 2022-208, 25 North Chester will not um, postpone until the next postpone until 719. So if anybody is here in opposition for, for that one, that won't be heard on 719. I don't think that there was. That was okay. something else. So we just have two then. Yeah. Oh. Wait a minute. So that was 2022-208. Uh, and so we'll now move to 2022-210. Yeah. No, you found out the way. Uh, 2700 West Baltimore Street. Jose Rodriguez. Hello. Uh, Hi. I'm representing Jose Rodriguez. Okay. And your name? Uh, Kirenia Sera. You need to spell that for this gentleman. Okay. Let me just spell your first and last name. Uh, K I R E N I A, last name S E R A. Okay. Um, and we're going to swear this witness. Wait a minute, Michelle. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. This is a request to add a carry out to existing grocery deli on the ground floor? Yes. All right. I hear from staff and planning. So the application again is to add the carry out. The issue is the board does not have the authority to grant the carry out on this particular appeal. The property is located in an R8 residential district and has an existing retail goods deli use. It qualifies for a neighborhood commercial establishment, but a carry out is not allowed under neighborhood commercial use. Restaurants are neighborhood condition, can be neighborhood commercial, but they're intended primarily for on-site consumption. So without the ability to have on-site consumption of food, the board cannot grant a carry-out use. Um, what did I say? Uh, can't, the, grant can't, can't grant a carry-out um, and could only be a restaurant if you have seating. 
Can I explain to the owner? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's with Spanish. Oh. Um, well, do you want to hear what Mr. French has to say oh, first? Sure. So then you can Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this is a request to have a carryout food shop added to an existing grocery and delicatessen on the premises. The property is qualified for neighborhood commercial establishment use, as indicated by uh, a photograph included with the application, which shows that the property was, in fact, used uh, on the ground floor for commercial purposes. Uh, the department, however, consistent with the statement you just heard from your own staff is recommending disapproval of the use of the property for a carryout food shop because a carryout food shop would be a non-conforming use of the property and the zoning code does not authorize authorize creation of new non-conforming uses the department has no objection to approval of use of the first floor of the building as a retail goods establishment meaning a grocery store and delicatessen as a type of neighborhood commercial establishment because the existing structure qualifies this property for that use thank you thank you And is there something you need to convey to that? So gentleman? the answer is they want to, to build a carry out, correct? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, like, you, you, <laughs> like the, the whole carry out can't happen. There's no authority in the code for a carry out. Now, it may have been used that way at one time, um, but it cannot, you cannot revive that use today. Okay. But can still do the grocery, can still do the deli, just not carry out food shop. Mm -hmm. so we have to it's just the owner, just, just your, to say something. I mean, it's your appeal. Uh, uh, my name is Mo. You have to be sworn in and give your name. I do. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, I don't know why. I'm sorry, but your name? Then, uh, your name. The, the carry oh, Name. the those carry out in a been there for. How do you pronounce it? My name is Milha Rodriguez. Milagro. Milha. Milha. Uh huh. Um, M A E E R J A. M I L H A. M what was that? M I L H A. Mm hmm. What about you? Rodriguez. There you go. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. That carry out been there for almost twenty years in a uh, one year, two years, and I have a proof because almost all the ma the customers who go in there been telling me like, I don't know why they doing this to you because this carry out been here forever. And the only thing that we trying to do is remodel and put brand new everything and give you the what the customer around there wanted that they want to carry out going back. Because that grocery store never been there. It's, it was a carry out since the beginning. So, I don't know. Is, <clears throat> is there any way that you can add uh, perhaps seating and we could still offer food maybe? Would you allow us to do some seating? Seating, on seating the primarily. Well, hold on. Uh, I just wanted the record to be clear because we're speaking at the same time. Do you have a response to? Oh, I'm saying, would you allow us to have some seating with a city permit to have tables outside? No. I don't know if that counts. Have some space. I don't know if that counts. You have to apply for a restaurant, and you would have to apply for outside seating. A restaurant is a permitted use. A carryout is not. I'm just, I'm looking at your yeah. permit history really that, quickly. So what that means is it can't be just carry out food. If you have a place that has, if it is a restaurant, people are permitted to carry the food out but you have to have a space for them to sit down because it has to be a restaurant and not a carryout. It's a weird distinction, but it's it is no longer allows carry outs, yeah. carry outs. You can carry out of a restaurant, but you cannot have a carry out. Solely. Yeah. Solely. So you have to change the application to be a restaurant, and that would allow you to permit it. So there's instead of carry out, but it was a carry out. Okay, I, I'm going to explain this to you, okay? A carryout is a defined term. The permits issued for this have always been a delicatessen, which is a different term than a carryout, all right? So when you apply for a carryout, the whole history here is as a, as a, as a deli and grocery, right? That's the history. So even though people are telling you they're walking in and going out with food, 
your only use permit that was ever issued was for a delicatessen. Now, that could have been something different and defined under the old code, but carry out food shop is defined differently under today's code. So it's always been a delicatessen. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so do you say, if I change the, stay, the carry out for a restaurant, because I, it's already uh, a grocery store and deli, inside the mm -hmm. store. Right. So if I change it, grocery store and restaurant, maybe you'll be approved everything? So, well, well, you have to change your application, right? So what, what we can do so is do we can hold off. You can amend your application for a restaurant, but you're gonna have to show seating. You're gonna have to show some place that people can sit down yeah. inside. So, you could always ask as well for outside seating. Like the board doesn't grant outside seating. You would have to get kind of a use and occupancy. You would have to, Mr. French, it's um, Department of Transportation can give you a right of way permit to put tables outside. So that would be part of it. So if you want to do restaurant um, and then, you know, people do take away from restaurants, that's the only thing this board could grant you is restaurant. You have your existing deli use, that can continue. Um, the grocery, that can continue. You can do all that without coming here. But in order to do, have people take away food, hot food and things that you prepare, you have to have a restaurant. Indoor tables and chairs. Put some table on it. Yeah. So yeah. what would be the minimum seating that you are requesting? There's nothing in the code that says minimum seating. Okay. Becky. I, I wouldn't, there's no minimum seating, but it does say that it, a restaurant is primarily for on-site consumption. So if you have a table in the corner, but almost everybody takes their food to go, it wouldn't really qualify as a restaurant. It would have to be primarily for people who sit and stay. In conjunction with the deli and the grocery. Right. Yeah, so whatever yeah. space is dedicated to restaurant has to be primarily for restaurant. We understand that this might be a three-use property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a apartments on top. And then well, I meant the, the bottom part, the, the part that's the deli and the grocery right now. Okay. okay. I guess we will revisit it uh, and see what we can do. And then I will amend it to the same application. Okay. Based on what she decides to do. I understand. Okay. Thank you. So, so just to be clear, what you would need to do is call us back amend your application, resubmit it to the board. You'd have to repost, right? Because it would have to identify the use that you're, what you're trying to put in. Okay? Like restart the process again, understood. Yes and no, in that I don't want you to have to apply again because then you'd have to pay again and then you'd have to get in line behind everybody else again. So what, what you wanna do is you have to submit to the board um, an amended application from carry out to restaurant, right? But keep the, the deli and grocery has to be submitted and you would have to ask for a new hearing date on that. And you'd have to have a site plan showing your tables. If you wanted to do outside seating, I would do the research on that first, we'll get the Department of Transportation, show where your outside tables would be if they would approve it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are we postponing this? What are we doing? Which one? Um, one yeah, one basically right. I think it's a postponement to allow them to amend if they want to amend. Yeah. But if you just want to keep doing what you're doing, you don't have to come here. Okay? Okay. And case number 2022-214, 248 South Broadway, Jasmine Trammell. Okay. Good afternoon, are you Ms. Trammell? Yes. Oh, how are you? Uh, this is a request to use as an art studio and add live entertainment, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, can we swear the witness? The assembly swear affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I hear from staff and planning. So the request is a live entertainment, and a live entertainment it can be an accessory use to restaurant, tavern, art studio, or art gallery. The applicant is requesting live entertainment from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day. 
So the, the problem is, is this an accessory use? Accessory use means that it's customarily incidental and subordinate to the principal use of the lot or the principal structure served, and two, is located on the same lot as the principal use or principal structure served. So if live entertainment um, is every day from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., where's the, the incidental and subordinate? So accessory has to be not a primary I have a question use. about that. Yes. How is, as a dancer, how is art defined? Is it, is it performing art or is it just visual art? Because if it is, if it is an art studio, then if it, they're live so entertainment. So there's, let me, I'm gonna tell you what the definition of an art studio is and I'm gonna tell you what the definition of live entertainment is. Okay. Because there are visual arts and there's performing yes. arts, right? right? Two very different things. Well, right. kind what, of. What are you looking up first, mm -hmm. Mr. French? <laughs> I don't even know if this is valid. Right, Becky's already got it. I understand the question. Um, okay. Art studio is an establishment in which an art, a type of exercise, or an activity, it's broad, Yeah. is taught, practiced, or studied, such as dance, martial arts, photography, music, painting, gymnastics, or yoga. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. So, so the performing, so we can do have dance performances there without being live entertainment. Live entertainment is defined as, Mr. French, would you happen to have it handy? All right, <laughs> thank you. So li entertainment live means musical act including karaoke, theatrical act including play, review, or stand-up comedy, dance, magic act, disc jockey, or other similar activity, right? So there's a bit of an overlap, mm -hmm. but if it's not as part of the art, right? So if you wanted to have a DJ from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., like that wouldn't work. What if it's DJ school? That's different, it's not an art studio, that would be a school. That's a commercial school. What if it's, never mind. I'm, <laughs> Well, I, will, I, will I appreciate the, the debate. <laughs> well, no, I understand I where you're coming from. Be her application. And I spoke with um, David McGinnis over at Baltimore City, and the reason that he told me to apply the accessory was for dance and DJ. Oh, okay. Which so. was the questions that basically she was saying because it's so broad with the art studio. The assumption is there that those are uses within art studio. But they told me in Baltimore City, I have to add live entertainment. I would art room. Now, DJ, so the difference is, yeah. right? Hold on a second. Definitely an art. Martin, have you given your report? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I know why Mr. McGinnis went out, because Mr. McGinnis is chief of special investigations. So when he went out, what he saw right. was a party. He right. didn't see. Um, so in his eyes, he saw you guys having fun. He didn't see art studio right right so dance performances mm -hmm. are very different than people coming to dance to a dj okay okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's if you look at what's intended by art studio right it's creative art Mr. Mr. French, you want to help me out here? Like so, so, I, so I, this is the thing. I do not want you to get into any trouble here. Well, that's why I'm adding the. You accessory could if add the live entertainment mm -hmm. as an accessory use, but you put 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. I get it now. Okay, <laughs> so your problem could be solved by limiting your hours right. for that. Because when he goes out and he sees people just having a great time, he's like, mm, "This is not an art studio." Right? I get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna let Mr. French go, and we might be able to solve all of this, all of these problems with ours. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Planning department reviewed the application. Notes this site is in the Fells Point Historic District. The live entertainment uh, requirement does include uh, a request for a statement of the maximum number of people who would be on the premises at any given time as visitors or patrons. That, of course, was not answered in this application because, as we discussed, the fire marshal will not give a fire capacity rating for a building until the use has been decided. So, uh, however, the department encourages the applicant to inform the board of the maximum number of people that they would anticipate uh, being on premises assuming the fire marshal would approve that maximum number. 
Uh, secondarily, the department also encourages the applicant to work with the Fells Point community and the upper Fells Point community, this property being sort of in the transition area between the two, uh, on uh, conditions for operation of the live entertainment use and most specifically, of course, as mentioned, the hours, days and hours of live entertainment occurring. Um, the department was also concerned that there was not a specific off-street parking plan or specific security plan included in the application that was available to it and encourages the applicant to both work out those details with the Fells Point and Upper Fells Point communities and also to inform the board of those details. Uh, subject to that, the department notes that when the time comes for approval, because this property is in the Fells Point Historic District, it would recommend these conditions of approval to the board. All exterior changes, including addition, demolition, alterations, and signage, are completed or installed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. A copy of the use and occupancy permit for the premises must be kept on premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. A copy of the written approval by the board of the live entertainment provided on the premises, including details of any restrictions or limitations on live entertainment provided, must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. And a copy of all other permits and licenses required pursuant to the written approval of the board must be kept on premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? <laughs> Uh, let's see. The first question was in regards to security. Um, we primarily probably will be using the live entertainment for exhibits and events um, performances. Excuse so, me. could you first, before you go to that, could you first explain exactly what you want to do? What are you doing? Okay, so we're a creative art space. So throughout the week, we plan to do a create art, creative arts program, um, and then in the evenings, we would like to do like karaoke and stuff like that. which is another reason for the live entertainment because karaoke falls so under karaoke live entertainment. So karaoke DJ in the evening could be accessory to the art studio if you have. Right. How many patrons do you expect? Uh, I, I guess during a typical weekday and also on a weekend. Um, during a weekday, I would say maybe, I would say about 60 to 80. All at one time? Um, not at one time, just within a time, a lot of time frame. What's the maximum um, at any one time, would you say? In discussion with the fire marshal, the maximum people that I could possibly have because it's a 4,300 square mm -hmm. foot space, um, they did mention that they could possibly give me 100 people at least um, because they didn't include the rear space that I do have. And this is the 200 block South Broadway Yes. Washington Hill. Broadway and Goff? Go? How do you say that? Golf. Golf. Golf Street, right? Golf. Golf. Yes. That's um, Washington Hill, that particular neighborhood, I'm told, <laughs> has uh, a lot of uh, recovery treatment centers and things like that. So the neighborhood often attracts, you know, some of the behavior that, that comes with the, those uses and those properties. Okay. How do you expect, you know, especially at night, do you expect, do you have a plan on how to deal with, you know, keeping your patrons safe and also trying to stay away from any riffraff that may come through that area? Um, are these recent reports or are these reports uh, I, um, this is from report, previous This is time. a personal report just from um, just, just from my experience in renovating the premises and stuff, we haven't seen or witnessed any issues in the evenings because the rehab facilities that are neighboring, uh -huh. They tend to be closed okay. towards the evenings, so you don't and a lot of a problem for you. No, and a lot of the commercial businesses that are on the block, they tend to be closed, and then the residential space behind us have been okay. demolished. Um, so, have you had any interactions with anybody from like Washington Hill, Fells Point? community associations, anything like that, good or, good or bad, have you had any? Not issues? from the associations, unless my neighbors are a part of them, mm -hmm. but in regards to Broadway as a whole, a lot of the neighbors within, I would say, a three, four mile radius I have interacted with. And what, what would you say has the response has been to your, to the studio? Excitement. 
<laughs> um, definitely excitement. It's a little up away from the traffic, which a lot of people are happy about. Um, because it's just not in the heart of where all the riffraff that you mentioned exactly exists. So we're above Broadway Market, so it kind of helps. Okay. Next door to a dentist? Yes. I actually know him personally. <laughs> He's actually really a great guy. Did Investigator McGinnis talk to you about a late-night commercial operator's license? No. Just giving you a little friendly heads up. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do intend to stay open until 2 a.m., mm -hmm. unless you have a liquor license, you have to get something called a late-night commercial operator's license to operate between midnight and 2. Could you write it down for me? Mm -hmm. I sure can. Thank you. <laughs> Once I can write it. I have a notepad. Oh, yeah. So I guess the other, other concern was just um, whether you would need to limit your hours. Is that something that she would have to do in the upper period? So, so I guess the, the, where we were stuck was what's accessory about it, right? Mm -hmm. You want to keep your art studio, which does include dance, but you also want to have a DJ and you want to do karaoke and you want to do fun stuff in the evening. So if you were to limit your live entertainment hours, in no way would that restrict your ability to have dance performances um, at the art studio or do dance classes at the art studio, but if you just wanted to have a DJ or, you, you know, to have people come in and dance or, you know, to, in, in a more social way or to have carry, like a karaoke night in a more social way, that fits into that live entertainment bucket. And in order to have that, it has to be accessory. So when we think about accessory, think about subordinate. It used to be that like, I'll give you an example of what I used to tell people for retail tobacco shops, right? You mm -hmm. could have on-site smoking. Somebody's going into one of these fancy-dancy cigar, cigar, cigar shops, right? You're not going to drop a bunch of money for a cigar unless you try it a lot of the time. So they would have accessory smoking. So they would cordon off a portion of their space. So say they had 100 square feet, they would cordon off 25 square feet mm -hmm. for that accessory smoking. Right, so you think about accessory use, you can think about it in terms of hours, or you can think about it in terms of space. Right, like a shed in your backyard is, is a structure, but it's an accessory structure. You don't live in it, but you put a bunch of junk in it that helps you live in your house. So for your use, your hours, and these specific things could define what's accessory about live entertainment but to establish your hours from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day, you're no longer accessory, Got right? You. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I would say maybe from Thursday to Sunday, um, more so afternoons, evenings will work. So um, Thursday to Sunday. 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m.? Let's do, can we do 3 p.m. in case we have like some type of 3 p.m. to 2 a.m., three days a week. I mean, that's better. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's better. That's defined, right? So right. essentially, if, you were, if your normal hours of operation were seven days a week, 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., that's accessory. Right. Like what you just described, that's accessory because it's okay. a chunk of the day, only so many days a week. Okay. That's fair. What days did you say again? Thursday through Sunday. Thursday to Sunday, 3 p.m. to 2 a.m. Instead of every. <laughs> and you're fine with that? Yes. Do you plan to charge admission? Say that again? Do you plan to charge admission? For events like karaoke, yes. Or even performances, yes. That's the only question that we had, right? The That's the only so matter before this board is um, the accessory, accessory, live entertainment accessory use. Right. And the applicant has amended her application at this point, right? Amended yeah, her. you can amend on the basically. Well, it's still accessory. You just identified for us how it is accessory right. now by limiting your hours. And just so you know that like what the board will have to say is that, you know, the 3 p.m. to 2 a.m., um, so long as it's, compliant with all other laws of Baltimore City and that's where that late night commercial operators license comes in so even though we say 
you could do 2 a.m. Like, we don't have the authority necessarily to say you can stay open from midnight to 2 a.m. without getting all of the other approvals and permits. Okay. Just so, so that you know, because I don't want you to get stuck. Got it. Okay. Did we forget anything, Mr. Wrench? Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Are we good? Good to go. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. All right, so now the board um, just needs to deliberate on this one, and this is our only one left to deliberate. Thank you guys for your patience. I mainly do this so I can stand up and stretch. <laughs> Not that y'all can't hear me from down there. That works. Um, I think that um, just like with the only other one we deliberated on today, I don't. there's no opposition from anyone in the community. community so. There's no public interest, and I don't think the evidence as presented shows any way we can, especially now that there is an ex a condition, excess, now that it is def a defined accessory use, I don't think that there's anything presented in the evidence for us to deny this. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, based upon uh, the applicant's presentation and application, um, I do not believe that the art studio will present. Uh, any no the accessory use of the we're art not studio. both uses aren't mm, the art studio is, it's just the accessory studio. use oh, oh, yeah, okay. well I don't think that the live good. entertainment will yeah. uh, attract or any negative consequences to this particular location and it's only district than any other live entertainment so I, I vote to approve it with the co with the defined accessory use as Thursday to Sunday 3 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sunday yeah. I agree for those reasons stated. I also agree for those reasons. I agree. Are we off the record? We are off the record and we are done. Right, so off the record, record, and all the way closed, closed. Congratulations. Your fingers.